So I was getting the insides of dead bodies and making slides out of them. What? Yeah, it was quite... Getting the insides of dead bodies and making slides out of them? Yeah. So I was sitting doing my doing my notes, surrounded by like 300 tubs of brains. So there was just like... <laughs> wow. Just piles of brains next to me. Does it make sense that you could instill a phobia? And he said, yeah, of course. You could make a man afraid of his own dick. And I was like, oh, fucking <laughs> sign me up. How much is it? <laughs> so we put the needles through his nipples. What, went, acupuncture sort of fine. No full, like, proper needles that you would get for the hospital. So yeah, she's like, it's just like stabbing a bit of cheese, honestly, <laughs> you'll be fine. So I put in the cereal. Yes. And he starts eating it. And I was like, that's not disgusting enough. So I made him... Oh. Into the cereal and into the rest, right? And then was he not sick? He was close. He was more turned on than sick. Yeah. So imagine. Then I got him to stick the twix up his <laughs> <laughs> and then eat it. <laughs> so yeah, a twix that had been up his and it took me a while before I could eat a twix again. But yeah. yeah. And um, so is that where you demand money? You just take money. You just want well, to a, give me that's money. A sweet deal. Yeah. I'm open to appointments. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I threw a big pile of tights in the middle of the room and he just rolled about in them, <laughs> having the best time of his life. And I'm just like, okay. And it's as if I wasn't even in the room anymore. It's just him rolling about a big, pair of, big pile of tights. He wanted that in a game show setting. <laughs> so, and I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another oh show. <laughs> <laughs> and a cop car comes up behind me and I'm like, I've got a guy in my motor. Oh, no. And we are a bag over his head. And, and I'm like, what am I going to say here? Like, So then, and I'm going, right, but if I say that he's just oversensitive to sunlight, then how am I going to explain the fact that his hands are zip tied <laughs> and there's a knife under the seat? Like, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> Travelled the world, I get married, and then he died, and all sorts of oh, things happened. What? I will get into that later. <laughs> like, I just didn't know how to deal with the trauma. I didn't even know it was trauma, because at that point, like, I mean, I'd went a period in my life where I didn't cry for 11 years. Like, I'm just not a crier. That's when my drinking really took off, and then I became alcoholic. Like, it just, that really took over, and I was just like, anything, so I don't need to feel anything. And um, that went on for a good few years. You, you can be whoever you decide to be, and that can change in any given moment. All you need to do is decide. And if you want to be taken seriously, you need to take yourself seriously. Definitely. Hello, everybody. It is Halloween, but <laughs> it's way after Halloween by the time you're watching this. Hence! <laughs> and we have a treat for you. Andrea is with us this evening. You may have seen her on other interviews as the headmistress. She specializes in disciplinarianism. Yes, in humiliation. And humiliation, role play. role play. Role play, all sorts of things. Sorry. First five minutes on YouTube. We have to be careful what we say. But it's, <laughs> but, but it's open season after that. But Andrea also has... She's balanced in both worlds. She has a coaching business. Mm -hmm. And we will be putting the links and her email in the description box below this video. So whether you want to be coached or you're a slave looking to be dominated, all of the content information will be down there below <laughs> the video. <laughs> and she's hiring. <laughs> <laughs> well huge thank you for coming on andrea thanks yes, for having thank me you. yeah and you've got a lovely accent <laughs> cheers yes did you grow up in that in glasgow was it yes i grew up um i've moved a lot during my life so i started off in a really nice area of glasgow where it was all kind of like suburban and guys went to work women stayed at home it was all that kind of middle class area and then my parents split when I was 11 and we moved to an absolute dog rough bit of Glasgow. So, Garbles um, estate. 
Uh, no, it was Hag Hill, and it sounds just as bad. Hag Hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, even the dogs were hard. Mm. So there was, like, this dog, Dougal, that used to sit in the middle of the street, and if vans were coming up, it would need to get around the dog, because the dog would just sit there. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, it was just, it was wild. Um, there was people knocking lumps out each other, like, in the middle of the street, and then... Like there was one door where you could chap on the door and you could stick a fiver through the letterbox and then a wee bit of hash would get flipped <laughs> out the letterbox at you. You'd never saw who it was, but... <laughs> were you a wild child or were you normal back then? Uh, normal. I had to go... I went from like this kind of posh area into quite a rough area and I had to fit in. So I did get a bit wild, but it was more about like trying to survive because I didn't you know there was no internet or anything back then so nobody really knew your backstory so everyone speaks differently and everybody's kind of up to different things so if somebody gave me a cigarette I smoked and if someone gave me a drink I drank and if somebody Mm. gave me anything else I took it because I wanted to fit in with everybody and that's kind of what I did um, but yeah, so I was a wee bit wild and I definitely did go off the rails for a bit. So yeah. Were you like shy before you became wild? Painfully. Were painfully you? shy. Uh huh. So shy. Like mm. I was so in my shell before I moved to, to Hag Hill because so in my house, like my dad's alcoholic and my mum was just trying to keep the house together. So it was like the whole house was just carpeted with eggshells. Like, you know, you didn't know what it was going to be like when you got home from school. And the only people that I'd really spoke to as adults were my parents. So that's what I thought everybody was like, because that's your example at home. So when I went to school, I found it really difficult to to kind of form relationships with people because I had this mistrust of people. Um, and like teachers and things, I couldn't put my hand up because I was too scared because I thought, what if I put my hand up and somebody shouts at me or, you know, so it was kind of, that's the way I was. And then when I, when I moved to this other place, um, I thought, right, this is a new start. I can be whoever I want to be. Nobody's ever going to find out. So I just decided there and then, right, who do I want to be? And I became, like, I had to try and survive that. So I decided, right, if I'm funny, I'll not get my head kicked in. So I'll be funny. So you became a class clown. Yeah, so I was funny. I was able to, I became a bit of a chameleon. So Mm. I was very smart. So I could hang about with the the kids that were really smart. But I didn't hang about with them too long because I knew they get their heads kicked in. So, (laughs) (laughs) But I was also kind of clever enough to be and funny enough to be able to hang out with the Neds as well so I hung out with them so I was kind of like a floater you know I didn't really have a crew or like a a group that I hung about with but I was able to just flip between so I could drink enough to be able to fit in with the people that drank I could smoke enough to fit in with the people that smoked and I just that's just the way I did it and um yeah so I became very adaptable. Do you have any siblings? One sister, yeah. So she's younger. she's seven years younger. Yeah. So she missed a lot of that. Did you protect her on the battlefield of the, the estate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so because I saw that, you know, being funny, being able to laugh at yourself, don't take yourself seriously, um, you know, and don't take things personally or take get you know, develop a thick skin. And I knew that that was how I kind of survived school and stuff. So I passed that on to my sister because my mum was, she was out working constantly. She was working two jobs, doing night shifts and things. So it fell to me to look after my sister because my dad wasn't taking us at the weekend or anything. So I made sure that she was aware that, you know, just have a laugh. Don't take things too seriously. Be confident. If somebody says something to you, who gives a fuck? Like, it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, and I really instilled that in her. And now she's like super confident, hilariously funny. <laughs> um, doesn't take herself. She's better than me. Like she's <laughs> way funnier than me. Um, yeah, and she's she's a way up in Aberdeen now. She just got married recently. And oh, um, congratulations. Uh, she's, she's great. What interested you in school? Science. Loved science. science. Uh-huh. Chemistry? Uh, I loved biology. That biology. was my thing. Oh. I did kind of, I liked chemistry up to a point and then I got this teacher 
He was Dr. Rafferty, or we used to call him Rafferty, right? Because he used to get the word fart in it and we found it hilarious. Obviously. Um, but he was a total sleazeball and it put me right off mm. chemistry. He used to sit and stare at the girls and then he'd be like, what do you do if your boyfriend looks at you like that? And I'm no. like, get out of here. So well, yeah, it was very strange. Uh, so that put me off chemistry, but I loved biology. And I think having the teachers that we had in that school for biology really helped. That and modern studies, because I loved the politics and, and all of that kind of thing. So, What interested you about that, biology? I liked learning about, it was human biology that I did, so I liked learning about my own body and the capabilities of the human body. And the teacher, when she was teaching us, she was like, is it possible that this could happen in a human body? And she really opened our minds to the po- to, like anything's possible. It is possible you can have seventeen toes. It mm. is possible you can be born with one eye. It is possible. And she really opened our minds to that because we were all, you know, as kids, sometimes you're kind of stuck in this. Well, this is the way people are, and that's it. We just she kind of really let us see that anything's possible for you. And I think I took that on board in a few different ways. Not just my body's capable of anything, but. I'm capable of anything. So that was a really good confidence boost. Um, but with the the modern studies, I love the political stuff. Like, And that was something that I really carried through because I, I had that sense of like dealing with injustice, making sure that things are you know, dealt with democratically and, and all of that kind of thing. And I actually ran a petition in school so that girls could wear trousers and not a skirt. <laughs> Did you I, win? I won it, uh-huh. Yeah. So they waited until I'd left school <laughs> and uh, then they brought it in the year after. But I was going around the playground with a petition, right? What do you think? <laughs> do you want the girls to wear trousers? And everybody was signing it. But yeah, I wasn't very liked. <laughs> I was doing that. <laughs> by yeah. who, the boys? Uh, by the teachers. Because really? I was like... I find I said I find it sexist that we have to wear a skirt and they were like but you've got tights on so like you're covered I went, but it's still cold and mm. and you know tights don't really unless you're wearing three or four pairs and then your tights burst and then you need to buy new tights so we're unfairly discriminated against financially as well as like by what we're wearing and stuff so I was riding my high horse about it <laughs> <laughs> and when I get on my high horse I'm on my high yeah. horse I'm not getting back off it until something changes <laughs> so um, but yeah, and all of that came back to me when I was doing the trade union campaign as a as a dominatrix and like fighting to keep the strip clubs open. Wow, so, wow. We'll definitely yeah. get to that activist. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about sports when you was young? Oh, I hated sport. Hated every bit of it. I hated you? swimming because I was like one of the only ones with no tits. So I was just <laughs> like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> um, and like basketball and stuff. I was decent. I was decent at athletics because I could run. Because in an old boob situation. Yeah. Yeah, no, but good nothing jiggling or anything <laughs> like that. I know. Yeah. There was one girl, Amber, she had massive do's and she was like, she hated running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's no good. Um, but no, sports was not my thing. What about drama? Um, I didn't take drama, but I did. We had to do it as part of like the first to fourth year stuff, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really my thing, that. See, I'm surprised. <laughs> I think I was so shy, though. I was too embarrassed to do any acting. But outside of school, I did join a youth theatre. And we had to do this, like, dance thing in the Tron Theatre. And it was all kind of... It was all, like, wee white kids from, like, the East End of Glasgow. And there was a guy that was over from Africa teaching us. So there's all these wee kids and we're all doing, like, hip-hop dancing in the middle oh, of the Tron yes. Theatre. <laughs> and it was just, like, it was, like, semi-break dancing. And people were just looking at us, like, what he's doing? What were you dancing this was, to? Like, Can you remember? We're talking decades ago, you know, before. <laughs> so, aye, it was just a bit weird. But, um... I really enjoyed it. It was like made up music. So they'd just written their own music and got us to dance to it, which was like, and looking back, it was great fun. But um, but yeah, I remember getting a lot of odd looks and questions from people who didn't understand why we were doing that kind of dancing. But it was just, we were just, to us, it was like, we were just dancing and having a great time. So yeah, it was good fun. Did you have a set career path in mind from when you were like close to leaving school? Oh, no, not really. Um, when so I left school and the first 
well, I'd always kind of made money. So I used to sell chocolate in the playgrounds. Like, <laughs> you'd buy the boxes of wee chocolate bars and then sell mm. them. So I used to do that. Um, and then I was selling my dinner ticket. And then I was selling cigarettes. So you've always been a grafter. And the, oh, <laughs> always been a grafter. And then at 14, I was working in a taxi office on a Saturday night, answering the phones, doing a night shift. And then at 15, before I was legally allowed to work, I was working in Celtic Park, flipping burgers. Then they found out I was 15 and said, you'll need to come back when you're 16. So that was fine. Um, so I went back, done a bit of catering, and then I left school and I went into forensic medicine and I was doing a, a modern apprenticeship. So I was getting the insides of dead bodies and making slides out of them. What? Yeah, it was quite... Getting the insides of dead bodies and making slides out of them. Yeah, to, what to is the, what's, crudely. What, pro, what process, <laughs> what's the procedure to do that? So the pathologist will take um, samples of the tissue. So it will be brain tissue, heart, kidney, right. liver, just organs, sometimes skin. Um, especially if it's been like a drug death, they'll take a, a section of the puncture wounds if it's been a needle death and they'll bring that in. And then we'll, um, then what we would do is we would take the, the tissue which had been fixed in formalin, so it's formaldehyde saline solution. So we would take it out um, we would look at the notes and, and figure out what bar, what bit of the tissue we were looking for. Um, so we would cut through it to find the bit that they wanted and then we would take a section of that. That would go into a cassette, it's like a wee tiny box with holes in it. And then we would need to dehydrate the tissue and impregnate it with wax. So it would ground this machine which would put it through alcohol solutions and then impregnate it with different strengths of wax. So that would then come out in the cassette and we would take that and put it onto a hot plate mm. and we'd pour hot wax into moulds and we would flatten the tissue out in the hot plate and then put it into the moulds and then put the cassette back on top. So what would you would then have is a cassette with a bit sticking out of it with tissue embedded in it and then that would go onto a machine and it would get clipped in and you'd turn this wheel and it would move it up and down and there's a blade sitting um, against the, the wax block and as that moves down, it shaves off one cell thick. Um, and then you would take that section, put it into a hot water bath and then pick it up using a slide. And then it would get baked in the oven. I know there's a lot to this. Yeah. Baked in the oven and then it would go through a staining um, bath. So it would be usually hematoxylin and azine to stain the nucleus in the, the outside of the tissue. So it would go through there. Or if it was a special staining that you had to do, say it was like a... If it was um, so called asbestosis, it was a thing you would look for called mesothelioma, which is where um, you get asbestos fibres that sit in the lungs and then what the lung does is it um, starts to build cartilage around it. Mm. So as the cartilage starts to form, it joins up and then what happens is there's so much cartilage that the lungs can't move. <sighs> So you you die wide awake, uh, your mm. lungs can't move. Um, it's horrible, horrible death. But um, we would take slides and that would go through a different staining pre like procedure so that the, the, the docs would look for different things. But, but yeah, that's what we did. And we got we get some really interesting cases. And so we were the only one that was directly linked to the Crown Office. So we would get like um, we get like bad guys, good guys, people that had been in the papers. And Arthur Thompson. Yeah, all sorts of things, yeah. So I was sitting doing my, doing my notes surrounded by like 300 tubs of brains so there was just like <laughs> wow just piles of brains next to me it was it was bizarre i, I didn't eat meat you. for about a year um but yeah it was so fascinating though like and then the the time that i left was my grandpa died um he he died in his pal's house and because he didn't die in the house they had to take him in for an autopsy um, just to check the cause of death and then his stuff was in my work in a tub and and I was like I can't process that and then I was just like this is too much so I left yeah you have like a real positive spirit like a zest for yeah. life <laughs> do you think that working with corpses at an early age gave you a sense of mortality and appreciation of what we've got I would I would say so yeah like because I know that life's finite like yeah. we're not here forever and you know I was saying to you earlier about um you know if you had 24 hours left to live or if you had a week left to live 
because we know that we're all going to die one day, but we don't know when. Like mm. I could literally die in the next five minutes and I have no idea that it's coming. Or, you know, I could I could live for another 50 years. We just don't know. So, you know, why waste a day? And, and that's kind of, I've always been, I guess, since I moved school and went to that new school, that kind of put a sense of like, just be who you want to be because mm. what's, you know, what's the point? And like decide who you're going to be and I realise that you can do that like you can just decide without yeah. having any nobody's going to say anything like mm. you just and uh but I think when you've been a certain way for so long you think that that's how you're always going to be um but yeah so I definitely think that I think working in forensics gave me a real appreciation of like the how fragile life can be and yeah take it what was your next job so after that um after that, I get into sales. I was only getting paid six grand a year as a, what? As a, a, a really in forensic. forensics, yeah, six <coughs> grand a year. Grand it was nothing. And I was expected to get myself to college and back and all this. And I was like, this isn't enough. And when your grandfather's yeah. body parts came in, yeah, I think. And then, was... then my grandpa's in there. My grandpa looked like Columbo with a glass eye and all that. It was hilarious. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, gone. <laughs> but he um but yeah so I, I moved from there and I decided right I want to make some money so I'll go and I'll, I'll try sales I'll see what happens there so I was speaking to my mum and she said there's a modern apprenticeship you can do or, a, or like a training I think it was a city and guilds um and it was in call centre operations so I said right I'll go and do that it was a week's intensive training so I did that and I passed it and um and I said right I'll go and work in a call centre so I was due to go for the interview and and I couldn't find, I was all terrible for losing keys, couldn't find my keys. And I says, mum, can you leave me your key? I've got this interview and like, I'll, I'll be back before you're home. So it'll be fine. And she's like, no. So she just left and locked the door. And I'm like, how am I going to get to this interview? So I had stupidly wore uh, knee high, high heel boots, right? <laughs> As you do in an interview. And, um, and I decided to jump out the conservatory window <laughs> to get into to get into the interview. So I jumped out the window, landed in my heel, weird, um, went over in my ankle, hobbled to the bus stop, got all the way down to the, the interview, got the job, um, hobbled back, <laughs> got on the bus back, and I got home and I was like, oh, I can't walk. Oh. But I was so full of adrenaline that I hadn't really noticed it. So I went to hospital and I'd torn all the ligaments and stuff in my foot oh, just getting yeah. this getting this interview. Um but yeah, so I went and I sold gas and electricity over the phone for Virgin. Uh, and then from there I did another few call centre jobs and then from there um I ended up in phones for you. So I was selling mobile phones, uh, and that was that was wild. Like what phones for you? I remember uh -huh. them. <laughs> they had us out in the street with whistles and hats on, dragging people <laughs> into the shop, and um, and the boss I had at the time, because I was cutthroat in there. Like I would stand in front of you to get to a customer. Like I was telling <laughs> Andy, my boyfriend, about this the other day about like how I would just step in front of people. Or there was a guy Brian, and if I saw someone coming in carrying a phones for you bag, I knew it was a return or a repair. So I would send them to go and see Brian, the technical <laughs> expert, and Brian would be like, I'm just a sales guy. And I'm like, Brian will sort you out. And then I'd just go and get more customers. But So I did that. Then I left there um, and I went into recruitment for a bit. And I, I really didn't like recruitment. I was used to being able to just swear and whatever else in phones for you. And then all of a sudden it's telephone voice. And I'm like, I don't fit in here. So <laughs> I left there. Um, and then I went to, what did I do after that actually? Um, I went into sales in pharmaceuticals. Sorry, no, it was cars. I did car sales <laughs> first. So I did, uh, I sold cars for Mercedes and I did that for a while. And then I moved over to Ford and I sold cars for Ford. And then when I was selling cars for Ford, um, I went into I went into town one night with the guys for work, and um, it was getting towards the end of the night. Now at this point, I was so anti, I was anti stripper, I was anti sex work, I was anti everything, right? Anti pornography. I like I was such a wee prude, 
And, um, Did you know much about the industry back then? Nothing about no. it. All I knew was that my boyfriend at the time watched a lot of porn <laughs> and I was insanely jealous so <laughs> and insecure, right? <laughs> so I was like, I hate them all. So <laughs> so then he was so then I'm I'm in town with the guys for work and they were like, Do you want to go to the do you want to go to the chicken dippers? And I was like, Are we getting food? And they were like, No, stupid, we're not getting food. We're going to the like the chicken dippers, the strippers. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> Oh no, I can't. I'm not doing that. That's that's disgusting. They were like, Oh, lighten up, like you'll have a good night. So I said, All right, okay. Because I was drunk, I agreed to it. So <laughs> So we go to Seventh Heaven, which is this great, great club in Glasgow. And um and I was like, I had a face on me, you know, that face that you put on me, you're just like, nobody better talk to me. So we go through the doors and as soon as the doors open, I was like, oh, this place is magical. Like, <laughs> I love this. All oh, the decor was so cool. Um, paid our money, got in, went downstairs and um, opened up another set of double doors. And it was in the middle of what I later knew was called the mega dance, right? So during the mega dance, health and safety nightmare, by the way, wouldn't be allowed <laughs> today. But there was people hanging off at all sorts of bits of furniture, all dancing. It was a bit like Coyote Ugly. Like there was girls on the bar, the whole thing. And I was just like, oh my days, this is amazing. <laughs> and um, and I was just like looking about pure wide eyed and I just loved the energy of the place. And then I went up to the bar with the guys, got a drink, sat down. So I was looking about and I'm going, right, these girls aren't like, I don't look that different to them. They're just normal women. Because in my head, they were all like pure glamazons, like massive boobs yeah, and perfect. Tits, and pink nails, uh -huh. leopard print. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and a cloud of perfume, just. But, <laughs> but actually, like they were just normal women. And I thought, right, if they could do that, I could do that. And then I sat down and we had a couple of drinks and they were coming up and going, do you want to dance? And the guys are like, no. Nah. And they're going, okay. And then disappearing. And I'm like... So my business brain's starting to kick in because I'm a salesperson and I was like, surely you would start with an open question, find out a wee bit about the guy and then build a bit of rapport and then you're going to get dances. And I'm like, I could make money at this. Like, I could, I could do this. So so I kept my mouth shut and I had a dance with somebody and I was like, my brain's pure ticking. So the next day um, I thought, right, I'm going to give this a go. So I phoned up this um, this woman that did uh, less. I googled it, or was it Yahoo searched it, <laughs> and um, and I found this person that was offering lessons and how to dance. And I thought, right, I'll do that. So I phoned her, and um, in fact, no, before I phoned her, I phoned Seventh Heaven and asked for a job. And she said, "Have you danced before?" And I was like, "No." And she went, "Well, no. <laughs> like mm. you're going to need to go and learn how to dance first. And I went, "Right, okay." So then I went and got those lessons and then I went in and, uh, and I did an audition and I had nothing, I didn't know what to wear, right? So I had a pair of just my normal heels on, which are terrible for dancing in. And um, I had this like white kind of strapless, but it was like, like a weird cut. So it was longer at one side than it was the other. And it was like a, like a see-through material with a solid material under it. So I just cut the solid material out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I turned up in. I danced in that for six months. It was my money maker. Like, was so good. That was your go-to outfit, was the, the yeah, make-do. So, so I went up, done the dance, and then I did the um, I did the the audition for a, a lap dance on another girl that worked here, and um, and they said, right, you'll be fine. So when do you want to start? And you need to pick your stripper name. And I was like, I need a name. Like this is great. <laughs> So um, I ended up becoming Jade, and that Sorry? was my name. I was Jade for a while. Jade. 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 Yeah. And then from there, um, so I started working there, and then I, I travelled to a few different places just doing the dancing, um, and I just loved it. Like, I loved mm. the atmosphere. I loved the way that all the girls looked after each other. I loved the fact that if a guy was even rude to me, he'd get flung out the club. I was going to ask, did you get much trouble? Because what, like, what I was used to was you go clubbing, like normal clubbing and guys grab your arse or mm. they're rude to you or they're like overbearing or like they're all over you, pawing you and you're just like, this is too much. 
Whereas in there, like the women ruled. Mm. So, and I love that about it. So guys were very well behaved and anyone that wasn't was out the door in, in seconds. And all I had to do was look at a bouncer and look round again and he was out. So yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, and then from there, I ended up working in a... Uh, I've been through my whole job history here, but <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up working with a, a pharmaceutical company. So that's how, so I was talking to this guy um, who was I was dancing for at the time and we were chatting about what he did. He worked in pharmaceuticals, selling pharmaceutical products. And um, and I said, well, I did forensic medicine. Like, I love biology. I love all of the science stuff and I'm really good at sales. So do you have any jobs? And he was like, uh, yeah, we've got we've got jobs coming up, and I was like, okay. I says, well, I can't really give you my number, but I don't know how I'm going to get you. And he was like, oh, I don't know. And then I went in for a dance, came back out, and he wasn't there. But I told him that I worked in a car garage as well, so he'd went round car garages looking for me, <laughs> found me, sat me sat down and kid when he was buying a car, sat down in front of me. He's like, do you remember me? And I was like, yeah, I do. I says, he says, I've been looking for you. Here's my card. Um, apply as soon as you can. And I did, and I got the job. Wow. So, so then I'm doing pharmaceuticals as well as the the dancing. Um, and then from there, um, I travelled the world. I get married, and then he died, and all sorts of oh, things what? happened. I will get into that later. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. So then I was sitting in the um, I was sitting in the club one night, and there was a guy on stage getting his bum spanked. And I was sitting next to this big goth guy with the big new rocks on and all that. And he said, oh, my friend does that for a living. And I said, all right, okay, that's interesting. And um, he said, yeah, she's a dominatrix. And he was telling me a bit more about it. She's got this big penthouse and all that stuff. And uh, I mean, that sounds really interesting. Like, I'd love to do that. I'd be good at that. And um, and then he said, well, she's looking for somebody to train if you want to, like, get involved in it. And I said, ah, ah, okay. So gave me her details. I contacted her um, and that's how I became a dom. Wow. <laughs> what the training entail? So the training was one session where <laughs> she told me to do a few different things just to see if I would freak out or not. And, um, what and I was fine. So she had this guy in and he was like, he's quite a big guy, like a kind of bodybuilder type. Um and she got me to attach clothes pegs all down them and then take them off with a whip. So yes. I was bang on with it. It was great. Take them like, off with a whip? What, what yeah. type of whip? Like, uh, it's a cat and nine tail, so it's more like oh, a flogger. Oh, that's quite hard to use, isn't it, apparently? Yeah, so I just, I got it, got them off first go. I was like, yes. Well, all of them um, in one go? Oh, one at a time. Oh, You've got to take your time over this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, so did that. Had him like kissing my shoes, and then she showed me how to use the flogger on his backside. Um, what else did we do? I think we were face slapping him as well. But I was just getting stuck in. There was another girl that was there, <laughs> and she was like, "Oh, is he all right? Are you sure he's going to be okay?" And I was like, "Who cares?" Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Money's money. Yeah. <laughs> he said he wants it, so who are we? Are you, right? So, yeah, it was quite good fun. And then the second session that I did with her, just to make sure, was he walked in and I thought, oh, that must be like her, her uncle or something, right? Because he was like a wee old man that you would just see going, he had a paper under his arm and everything, right? And he was wee cap on and he came in and she took him in the room and had a wee chat with him and I'm like, that surely can't be him. And she's like, right, come on through. And I came through and he is naked on all fours. And I'm like, oh, my days. So then he gets up on the table and she's like, right, I'm going to show you how to put a butt plug in. And I'm like, right, OK, I'm going to have my fingers up an old man's bum here. <laughs> so she gave me some gloves, put the gloves on. Um, she's like, right, so what you want to do is get some lube in there and start loosening it off. And she's like, honestly, it only feels weird the first time. And I was like, right. So I put my foot and it was like warm, <laughs> kind of squidgy feeling. I'm like, ah, that's not so bad. So she gave me this pigtail, curly kind of butt plug. So I stuck the pigtail in it. The pigtail of his bum. Yeah. Fantastic. He'd like a wee, wee pigtail sticking out. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I've seen the horses ones. Yeah. This well, was a pig, you mean like the a fox, wee curly the rubber curly pig, one. pigtail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> class and that it was being your first day yeah that was like the the mm. second session that i did with her and then rolled him on his back so you still get this pig thing in 
He's strapped down onto this table. She's like, right, how are you with needles? And I went, oh, I'm fine with needles. I've had, I've had, like, I had my kidney out when I was younger, so I was getting injections and tests all the time. And uh, she says, right, we're going to put needles on him. I says, okay. So we put the needles through his nipples. Well, she went, acupuncture sort of fine. No full, like, proper needles that you would get for the hospital. So, yeah, not just, like, the wee <laughs> tip for acupuncture, like, right the way oh, through. Yeah, these little... Right yeah. way through his what? His nipple. His nipple. So, pierced his nipple. Yeah, through his, she's like, it's just like stabbing a bit of cheese, honestly, <laughs> you'll be fine. So I'm right through the nipple and um, oh. we've done all that and she's like, right, get the violet wand out, which is like, so we electrocuted where yeah. we had to put the piercings and stuff in and I, and I was like, oh, this is great fun, I'm loving this. And um, <laughs> and after that, she's like, you'll be fine, you can just start booking people in. Like you're... She knew you were a natural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, can you pop the heat over? What was your first, who was your first, like, it makes too much noise, you want to do my jacket? <sighs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Is you, do you not find it's cold in here? No, I'm all right. No. I've got a woolly yeah. dress on though, so oh, cheers. I'm all what right. Yeah. But... Who was your first yeah. client and what, what was he into? So my first client, yeah. um, he ended up sticking with me the whole way through. Like, is he still here to this day with you? He he doesn't live here, so he lives in he lives in Dubai. But he was coming over from Dubai, wanted a session, found my website, and was like, "Great, I want to go and see her." So he wanted um, he wanted food that had been stamped on, and I'd, I'd to eat it off the bottom of my shoe. He wanted humiliation. He wanted blackmail. He wanted like degradation, which is kind of rather than verbal humiliation, it's making people do stuff that's kind of degrading. Can I stop you there a minute? Blackmail. Yeah. Blackmail. Like pretend blackmail. Not role like, play you... blackmail. Yeah, role play so blackmail. So what? Like I'm going to tell your wife. Yeah, pretty much. But what he didn't know is that I'd spent six months living in Dubai, so I knew all the streets and I knew all the clubs <gasps> and I knew all the places, so I could get right into his head. Fuck him up. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> So he came in and, and I'm on the way and I'm going, right, okay, what am I going to get for this? Like to make this as disgusting as possible. So I went to a petrol station and I got, um, it's like cereal. So on one side it's cereal, the other side it's milk for like eating <coughs> on the go. Mm. So I had that and I had a Twix and, um, and I got a rolling ham as well. So I turn up, I know, <laughs> odd combo, but three courses, whatever. And um, so we get there and uh, and he's there and we had a bit of a chat and stuff and then we just get into it. So I'm like stomping on this rolling ham and I'm like, you better eat that. And then I opened up the the cereal and I, so I peed in the cereal. Yes. And he starts eating it and I was like, that's not disgusting enough. So I made him jizz. No! He jizzed into the cereal and then ate the rest, right? And then... Was he not sick? He was... Close. He was more turned on than sick. Yeah. So... Imagine. Then I got him to stick the Twix up his bum and then... <laughs> <laughs> and then eat it. So yeah, a Twix that had been up his bum. And it took me a while before I could eat a Twix again, but... Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that would... But the, the funny thing with him was that the next day, he sent me an email saying that was the worst session I have ever had. That was honestly, like, I don't even know why you're a dominator. It was scathing, right? And it was, he tore the whole session apart. Because he oh. wanted to be even more brutalised. I have no idea. But so I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. So I just, I thought, how am I going to deal with this? Right? My very first session, I was shaking at the start. And I've just been given this thing saying, why are you even a dominatrix, right? Now, at that point, I could have given up and never went back. But instead, you know, that was a turning, that was a crossroad moment for me, right? Did I keep what going to that stop? session was not good enough for his liking? He had a Twix up his fucking arse. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I emailed him back and I was like, actually, that was my very first session, pal. And, um... Mm. <laughs> And I think I did pretty fucking well. This was what you told me that you wanted and this is what I delivered. So what else did you want? Because you could have said while you were there mm. rather than wait until after the session and send me a scathing email because you're in a bad mood. 
And um, and he was like, oh, I didn't realise that. I'm so sorry. And then since then, he's been my client ever since. Wow. Does it get more extreme of him after after it, that one? Well, I mean, I've been over in Dubai and we've had, we've had sessions in Dubai and stuff. And and he can, whenever he's over, we always have sessions and, and things. And he's really into financial domination as well, which I learned and um that's, so is that where you demand money you just take money you just want well, to a, give me money sweet deal yeah i'm open to appointments uh, <laughs> 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 yes. check me out at my instagram in the description <laughs> box below <laughs> <laughs> so you just yeah. literally demand money off them yeah just like give me money they just here oh, you go he goes, okay, mistress. As <laughs> <laughs> if oh, I don't really want to do it. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, I know I've done. <laughs> yeah, so, I made the last time I saw him in Dubai, I made him jizz in his own tune way at home. Because <laughs> no. he was like 20 quid short. I was like, well, it's not good enough. You're going to have to jizz <gasps> into your own tune. So, yeah. So going, <laughs> going into your second client then, yeah. were you cognizant of... Were you thrown off a little bit by this first client's reaction? So, yes and no. Like it almost made me more determined to be better at it because like if someone tells me I can't do something, I just get super indignant about it. I'm like, fucking watch me and I make it happen and and that's what I did. Like I just set about learning as much as I could and I tapped into the resources that I had which was like all different doms that were all working from the same place so I'm like how would you do this and what would you do about that and I've got this request like anything that you would do differently and and it was great like we ended up we had such amazing creative sessions in that dungeon and like there was one guy that came in and he was really the one thing he hated was fatty meats or fatty foods so me and in this dom um, it was Mistress Lilith actually so we were uh, we had him dressed up like a wee schoolboy in the shorts and stuff that he'd brought with him right and he loved doing lines and he loved being scared so I was doing getting lines him, what cocaine no writing lines oh. <laughs> headmistress Punishment yeah. lines. No, but when he said, oh, yeah. So I was getting him to write <laughs> red leather, yellow leather, red lorry, yellow lorry. But while he was writing red leather, he had to say red lorry. So to say red lorry, but write red proper leather. Proper tongue twister. Yeah, so I was like, if you make any mistakes, I will toss your hands and rip them up and you'll have to start again. And he's like, oh, yes, miss. So as he's writing these things and saying it out loud, he's like, sweating trying and we were walking around him really slowly and like slapping the belt off the desk and stuff and he's like <laughs> sweating and everything and like you better hurry up you've got a time period that you need to get this done in and he didn't get them finished so his punishment was we got loads of bacon and a ham hock and some pork pies and we like boiled the ham and pour, like pulled the fat off it we microwaved the bacon till it was just cooked, you know, that horrible oh, way, so oh, it's silver, yeah. And then oh. we get pork pies and cut them in half. So oh. we were getting him to stick his tongue out and we were just rubbing the bacon fat off his oh. tongue and stuff. And he's going, Bleh. Well, it's nightmare, well, no. yeah. yeah, and then, and then she was, we're, so she was like slingshotting pork pies off him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you laugh during these appointments? We rolling about laughing all the time. Because <laughs> I mean, that's why I did it for so long. Because it's such a good laugh. If you take it seriously, like there's a lot of there's a lot of doms that do take it very seriously, and that's their thing, right? And that's that's cool. But for me, my style of domins, like it's fun. It's got to be fun, um, and. And I like people messing up because it's a reason to like to instill consequences or whatever it is you want to do. It makes it more interesting and more fun. Definitely. Do you remember so, yeah. what happened on the second appointment? <sighs> Everything after that was a bit of a blur, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had a few really big kind of standout sessions. I was telling some stories about this last night. I had one guy um, who, the first time that he came in to see me, he wanted to wear tights, loads of tights. So I got loads of pairs of tights and I had a pair of tights on his legs, I had a pair of tights on each arm, I had a pair of tights like all tied around his body. He was literally covered in nylon. He had another pair of tights over his head like a robber 
And then I threw a big pile of tights in the middle of the room and he just rolled about in them, <laughs> having the best time of his life. And I'm just like, okay. And it's as if I wasn't even in the room anymore. It's just him rolling about a big, pair of, big pile of tights. So that was fine. So then the next session he comes in for, I was like, what do you want to do? Like, I've I've got tights. And he's like, I just want you to blow smoke in my face. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> for a whole entire hour, I'm like chain smoking, blowing it up a mask. And he's like, <laughs> like choking and spluttering but he was loving it and then the next session that I done with him I said right what are we doing for this session thinking it'll be smoking or tights he's like I'd really like to eat a rolling jobby and I'm like okay right so sorry what a rolling poo so his we, own poo mine your poo uh-huh a ro- what do you call it a rolling a rolling jobby a rolling jobby uh-huh a rolling jobby a rolling jobby, a jobby. <laughs> So we, so I took a, I put in a, a Tupperware tub, and um, took it into town. I know, oh, this is what people will remember me for if this whole podcast is me just talking about jobbies, right? Oh. But so I put in the tub, and um, took a dinner roll with me and met him in town. So he he took the bag, went into the toilet in this bar. And um, I told him to go and make himself a roll and not come back until he did it. And I just sat in the bar and drank a Jack and Coke. Like, nice. And uh, he came back out and he's like, thanks, mate. I was like, don't breathe on me. Yeah, do Because yeah. you're stinking. And, um, and that was that session. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So then I didn't see him for a long, long time after that. And I was sitting in a, a cafe. It was upstairs and you could see out and stuff. And I'm sitting with friends of mine and we're just having, you know, those big Christmas coffees that you get with all the cream oh. and all that. It was lovely. So it's all these, like, they've got the Christmas tree up. It's all Jingle Bells playing <coughs> and everything. And then walks this perfect wee family. So there's, like, a woman and, like, three wee, like, perfectly, you know, the wee coats, beautifully dressed kids. So they all sat down at a table, like, with their backs to us. And then walks the dads with the, the coffees and stuff, and it's him. No. So I was like, oh my God. So I'm oh. seeing this guy in public with his perfect family, and I'm like, you eat rolls and shit. Like, oh my God. So he sat down and. Um, did, and he, he, did he recognize you right so away? So he was facing me, but the rest of his family were facing, they were had their backs to what us. What was his reaction like? So I just raised my coffee up, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> just smiled at him, and, uh, and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and um, a couple of a couple of days later, I get a message from him. Right, I won't have another session. It was so good to see you there in town, and I was like, oh, right, okay. So we had this session where he wanted to be a spy, and I'm like, can you not just do two sessions the same ever mm-hmm. in your life? And he's like, right, I want to be a spy. I says, right, well, I am going to plan the best spy date you've ever had, and uh, he said, right, okay. So what I did was I enlisted the help of another four doms, and. I said, you're going to be Agent P and I'm going to be like your boss at the spy company. And um, and this is going to be like your first assignment, your first mission. So I sent him an email and um, I said, right, you have to be at the Central Hotel. You need to get this bottle off of someone, but you need to be at the Central Hotel. I need you to sit at this table at this time. You need to be wearing a stripy scarf with a cup of coffee and a, a glass of orange juice. And he's like, okay. So he sits there. I've got another dom who he's never met and he doesn't know anything about. And she's just sitting watching him drink his coffee. So she he finishes his coffee. She walks up, sits down in front of him, doesn't say a word, takes a bottle of Lucasade out of her bag, opens the top and pours it in his coffee. And it's pee, right? Because he likes to drink pee. <laughs> so then she puts the bottle on the table, slides him an envelope, still s- says nothing and then just gets up and goes... And he's like, oh my God. So then he opens the envelope and it's like the instructions to go to the next place. And um, so he's drank the, he drinks all the, the pee and stuff and that's fine. So the next, because um, he can't leave it, obviously, because no. then the hotel is going to be like, why is there pee in your cup, sir? <laughs> so <laughs> so oh. then um, so then he gets up and he goes to... Um, he goes to the the next place and the next I said in the the instructions like you, there's a mole that you need to you need to approach and she's going to be wearing she loves tights and she's going to be wearing a pair of tights I need you to get them from her because we need her DNA so um I says but she be be careful of this one because she'll try and take you home and then she'll kill you and he was like okay 
Um, so he's went to this place um, and it was outside the house of Fraser and this girl walks up and starts chatting to him um, and she's like, oh, hi, how you doing? Do you want to come up the road with me? And he was like, eh, no, I'm all right, but like, I like your tights though. Your tights are lovely. He's like, how about, how about I buy you a pair of tights and you could give me them and I'll give you brand new tights. And she's like, yeah, okay. So she walks in, picks the most expensive <laughs> pair of tights, like Wilford's, they're about 75 quid. <laughs> and um, so he gets her the tights and then she um, she goes in, puts the tight, takes the tights off, puts them in the bag, takes the new ones out, puts them on in the toilet and she's popped an envelope in the bag and he takes the bag and there's an envelope in it with the tights, opens it up and um, and it's the instructions for the next one. So the next one is to go to the Solid Rock Cafe and he's to go and he's to order a pint of beer and, an or and a pint of Coke. And he and he says in the instructions, look, that wasn't the real mole, that was just a test to see how you'd go, but you're being watched. Um, the real person is going to be, she's going to try and um, approach you in the Solid Rock Cafe. Now, if you've drank the contents of that bottle earlier, that's the antidote for the poison smoke that she's going to blow in your face. So this is bringing in the smoke and fetish thing and the tights fetish and yes, everything else yeah. he's into. Mm -hmm. so, um, so he starts chatting to this woman and um, this woman's like, oh, do you want to go outside for a fag? And he's like, okay. So they go outside for a cigarette and she's standing there blowing the smoke in his face. He's loving it. Um, and then she puts the cigarette out, stomps on it and walks away. And, um, and he picks it up and puts it in the bag and then comes back to headquarters, which is my dungeon, for a debrief. <laughs> Um, and then we were like interrogating them and like, are you sure that that's who you met? Like you didn't speak to anybody else and all that stuff. And he was like, by the time we got to my place, he was shaking like, cause he was just so excited. Um, and that was one of the most elaborate, like big sessions that, that sounds ever elaborate. Planned. It was great fun. And how much does he pay you for that That much actually detail? wasn't a lot of money. It was like 450. You did it for the fun. I did it for the fun. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. It was great. So that was one of the big standout sessions I've done. But I've done some really silly stuff as well. What like? So I had a guy who really loves splosh and that's where you get food, food thrown sex, at you. Yeah. yeah. So he was, he wanted that in a game show setting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's only me and him in the room, right? So I'm playing, I'm playing the game show. Game show one. <laughs> right, so I'm playing the host. Yeah. I'm playing the audience and I'm playing his wife, right? And he's just him. So I'm like, who's got the easy job here? Yeah. <laughs> he's also, to make matters more interesting, wanted me to dress up like a fisherman. So I'm wearing a fisherman's coat. You know, like big... a yellow hat and yellow uh -huh. sort of raincoat. So I'm in a, a yellow fisherman's raincoat <laughs> as a game show host. I've no microphone, so I've got a big black dildo and I'm talking into that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another oh show. <laughs> I like to another show of Mister and Missus. Right? What did you call it, Mister and Missus? Right. So I was like, Jesus. and today we've got whatever his name was, and him um, and his wife, right? <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm like. <laughs> Like I'm the wife. It was just, and I said, so we're going to ask some questions about each other, and if they get them wrong, you know, there's going to be a forfeit. And um, I'm like, what do you think of the forfeit? And then I'm like, the crowd, yes. So, so I'm asking, like, it's so weird, right? So I'm asking questions, and he's getting them all wrong, obviously. And and um, and I was like, oh, was he getting get them wrong deliberately? Or well, I don't know the answers, right? <laughs> I'm his wife, so I was like, so then I was like, right, okay. So he's, he's got all the answers wrong. And I was like, audience, what are we going to do with him? So I'm like, gunch him, gunch him. So I was like, oh, I think you've got to get gunched. And I said, I'm going to ask your wife what she thinks should happen to you. Were you so like moving around the room to play these different characters? I was literally taking one step to the left and then like <laughs> a couple of steps to the right and stuff. It was so mental. And um, in the middle of a dungeon, like it was just in his mind, it's all alive. So... So then I, I'll go to the wife and the wife's like, he should wear my clothes, right? Because that's another thing that he's asked for. Now, most of the time when a guy wants to dress up in women's clothes, it's usually, in my experience, lingerie or something sexy or a wee short skirt or something like that, right? 
that's what I'm expecting. So I says, right, you, you're going to have to wear your wife's clothes for this gungeon. And he's like, oh no, this is going to be late. And I was like, oh well, crowd's spoken, so you're going to have to do it. And he's like, <laughs> fake fighting it. So <laughs> then I went and got the, I, I went to get the bag that he'd put the clothes in that he wanted to wear. And it was not lingerie. It was like a full length, down to your ankles, denim skirt <laughs> and a big woolly jumper. <laughs> Like the, like I'm not even form fitting, <gasps> like a big box square woolly jumper. <laughs> and I'm like, is that the right bag? And he's like, aye. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, cool, mm. put them on then. So oh. I'm trying not to be like shocked mm. by it. That was what was shocking me at the whole thing. So he puts these clothes on, gets in the bath, and I'm chucking custard at him, and I'm going, <laughs> you can't even feel this custard through these like thick, <laughs> thick denim <laughs> clothes. Mm, this is pointless, and I'm just standing there with this fucking... Did you not pull the jumper out and pour it down his back? Well, I was throwing it down his chest and stuff first, but yeah, and I was hoping it would soak in and things, but and I'm just standing there like a fisherman with a dildo throwing custard <laughs> over a guy in a woolly jumper. And I'm like, I can't even believe I get like paid for this i also kidnapped someone like fake kidnapped them oh wow in a a smart car <laughs> <laughs> it was oh, the most hilarious this. Thing. <laughs> so this guy wanted like fake kidnapped and then <laughs> so i was like okay where am i gonna get you from i don't know glasgow and i'm like right this is making things difficult right because i can't tell you to go and find a wee obscure spot so I ended up kidnapping them from Croy train station, right? <laughs> which is quite busy, I found out, because mm. I've never really been there before. So I go up to Croy train station and he sees my car coming in. It's a two-seater, tiny wee smart car. Um, it's the one, I've got it outside. So he starts walking over and, um, and I'm sat there in the car and he taps on the window and I roll down the window and he's like, hi, mistress. I was like, don't call me mistress. It ruins the fucking thing. So... <laughs> I lifted it, I had a newspaper with like a, a knife at my kitchen. So, <laughs> so I lifted that up and I was like, you better get in. And he's, like, <laughs> he's like, okay. So I went, like, just put the knife under the seat. So he put it under the seat and the paper under the seat. So he sat down. So shut the door and then I, I, I zip tied his hands to the bits of the car. So he's sitting there and he's like, right, okay. So we're driving down and I thought, I've got a pillowcase and I thought I'm going to put a pillowcase over his head. <laughs> But then I'm like, I can't do it in the middle of Croy train station. So I went round and I pulled in, put that over his head. And um, we're, we're travelling down a mine to the... And this is broad daylight as well, right? <laughs> so we're travelling down and we stop at the lights at the big busy roads, like a dual carriageway. And, um, and a cop car comes up behind me and I'm like, I've got a guy in my motor. Oh, no. And we are a bag over his head. And, and I'm like, what am I going to say here? Like... I'm going to need to say like he freaks out with sunlight or something like that. Like I don't, I don't know. I was like running through <laughs> options in my head, and um, and he was like talking away to me. So his head's moving about, and I'm like fucking sit still. Like <laughs> so then, and I'm going right. But if I say that he's just oversensitive to sunlight, then how am I going to explain the fact that his hands are zip tied <laughs> and there's a knife under the seat? Like I'm in trouble here. <laughs> but luckily, like I managed to get around the corner. I got home. Uh, and I got him to the house and I took the took the hood off. I said, I'm not walking you into the house with the hood on you. Like, that's just ridiculous. So I cut the zip ties off and stuff with the knife and then walked him down to the dungeon. Um, and I put him inside and I flung him in the bath and he was like, right, um, he was really into kind of like extreme humiliation. So I was just kind of, at that point, I was just like, so kind of bewildered with everything that I'd just done, like nearly getting caught off the police and all that, that my mind was going a bit blank, right? So I was like, what'll I do? So I just started chopping tufts out his hair. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was chopping cuts. It was all over the place. He looked ab an absolute riot. And um, and uh, he was just loving it. Absolutely loving it. He's like, this was so exhilarating. Like I loved every bit of this mistress. And I was like... He saw his bonnet in the end. I just made him get him on the, on the train. <laughs> Get the train back into town. <laughs> he like clumps his hair missing. He had no hat or anything. It was hilarious. So, so yeah, these were they were kind of some of the most. And there's another guy that was a had an egg fetish. So I would tie him up and cut eggs up under his nose, and he would just like smell eggs, and then he would bulk and I'd bulk, and then I'd put eggs in his mouth, and he'd chew them and spit them out, and oh, then I'd be like. Oh. 
Uh, no hard boiled eggs. And he was he was into that and he was really into um what are they called? Stink bombs? Oh my the god, they're capsules. Uh-huh. Yeah, that you stamp on. He's like, from the please, ground. please, can you set a stink bomb off? I love stink bombs. Have you smelled one? Yeah, they're disgusting. Did you say you loved them? He loves them. He loves uh-huh. them. <laughs> Total fetish. I used fetish. to buy them from a joke shop and set them off at school. Uh-huh. Yeah. He was so them, into them. Didn't he? he loves them. them. Mm-hmm. Loves them as in a hate love. Like, as in, I don't know if it was like the sulfur or something in them, but... Because it was eggs, it was cab, like sulfur containing vegetables, and then stink bombs. That's the whole thing that he was into. Not fucking poppers, stink nah. bombs. And the, the funny thing is, he used to buy me perfume every time he came up. <laughs> nice perfume? Uh-huh. Like I had a, he got me Donna Karen perfume. <laughs> and I was like, oh, good choice. And then the next time he got me Kenzo flowers. <laughs> oh, that was popular. I needed it after the stink bombs yeah. and the eggs yeah. and stuff. I was like, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> So what was the most common session you were asked for? Um, God, everybody was so, everyone had their kind of uniqueness to them, but I would definitely say ball busting was a massive thing for me because people that did clips or sold clips or did any filming were usually people that that's all they kind of did. So you had this kind of divide a while ago where you had the session doms and then you had the ones that did the clips and really they would cross over but I got this opportunity to go and do Kinky Kicks which was like a big ball bust in sight and and so I went over and did that and I filmed it was just me kicking guys in the nuts and they were like make me bleed and I'm like cool because I was doing <laughs> I was doing Muay Thai at the time so I was just like my kicks I could look at the wall behind me and still hit the target it was just <laughs> like it was great fun so um, so I did those sessions with them and that went online and everybody was like, oh my God, I need you to kick my balls. So that became like a big thing for me. was like what being a ball like kicker. A run and kick? Yeah. So what I really liked doing was like getting them to turn their back to me and put their hands in the wall with their legs apart. And then you just take a big run up and volley. <laughs> it was great fun. That so, seriously hurts. But isn't it a bit satisfactory? Super satisfactory. (laughs) Um, But one of the first events that I ever went to was um, down in London called Pedestal, which is a big femdom event. And um, so we're down there and there's this kind of corridor bit that you can go to. You've got the cloakroom, the smokers bit, there's like a goddess room and there's like this big long corridor. So I'm walking down the corridor and one guy was like, you're Harvey Kinky Kicks. And I was like, yeah could you please just kick me in the balls just once just once that'll be that like if you could just do that it'd be amazing and I went ah, okay so I says right stand there so you stand in and I was like legs apart legs apart um, and I just booted them in the balls so then this guy coming down saw it and he was like oh can you do me next so he's standing right so I've kicked him in the balls and then the next guy and then before and I know the it belt of- the whole <laughs> corridor wow. is just lined with guys just waiting for their kick in the balls and then one guy's like I bet you couldn't put me down with a kick and I was like easy so he went down like a sack of toys and then the next <laughs> guy is like oh that was amazing like d- like do me but no it's hard right I don't want it as hard so I'm like kicking him and then uh, the next guy comes in and he was like can you just like stand on my balls and I went okay well you we need to sit down then so he sits down and he's got his legs out and I'm just like like crunching them with my foot what type of oh. shoes did you have on? Uh, just high heels but like this like them yeah, nice to be <gasps> So it was just like, it was just guy after guy after guy. And I'm like, I'm like the ball kicking queen here. It's great. <laughs> and then every time I went to pedestal after that, it was the same story. Mm. It was always like a big line of guys wanting kicked in the nuts off me. So I then just became this like ball busting person. And then, so I mean, back in the day, like a lot of guys just knew what they were after, right? Sometimes they'd come up with a written note where they'd put so much effort into, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, and this is what I'm curious about. And and it was great because it made sessions really good fun, really. Like, there's two people in the room. But with their eyes are like porn, only fans, and all of those things, what I was starting to see was a lot of young guys coming in and mm. who don't know and don't have the maturity to be able to talk about sex because all they've seen is what they've seen on porn, so I'd say to them, right, what is it you're looking to try out? And they'd be like, oh, just domination. Just do whatever you want. And I'm like... Yeah, but how extreme? Or, I'm like, domination or... covers everything. So is it anything you don't want to do? Or, And they're like, oh, just like, just like dominate me. 
<laughs> Terry didn't have a clue. And They've I'm watched like, these pornos or whatnot. And I'm like, I mean, it could go from ignore fetish, where I just ignore you for an hour and take your money, or... I'd, I'd say I could do that. Like, I've got... A, <laughs> <laughs> like I was saying earlier, I've got a castration device like I've not used and I'm dying to use, so I could maybe just use that on you. And then they'd be like, oh, no, no, wait a minute, hold on. Maybe I've, think, maybe I've thought of something. <laughs> and um, I remember getting guys in who'd be like thinking they could take more than they actually could because they've seen it in a video but they're not they're just like biting off more they was there not a procedure where you could start them off on a sort of milder session building them up was that the usual sort of carry on yeah so that's what i would do as a matter of course anyway just do a bit of a warm-up and stuff just to get people into it but you would get especially the younger guys who are like they think they can take more than they can take i mean the older guys that have been doing this for a long time they had to build that pain tolerance up. Like, that didn't just happen overnight. Whereas the kind of younger guys would come in and they'd be like, just kick me as hard as you can. Just just, just go for it. I can take it. Um, and I'd kick them twice and they'd be like, red. <laughs> red. Is that your safe word? Hi. Red, red, stop. <laughs> and I'm like, right, you ready to have a normal session now? Like, and do it on my terms, not yours. Because I would just do that to teach them a lesson, two kicks, and they would, they would be shouting red. Did you ever have anyone run out crying or anything? Um, <laughs> One guy ran out crying. Yeah. yeah. And so he came in, and it was myself and Mistress Katinka when she was still working. And uh, we were, we had a Taws, a Loch Gelly Taws, which is like a long school belt. So we're hitting that just gently off his dick. And um, I know gently, it's the only time I've used that word, I think. And uh, <laughs> then we tied him to St. Andrew's Cross and we were chucking dildos and butt plugs at him. <laughs> 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 and just laughing at him. And he was like, he started crying. He oh, and he was like, I don't like this. I'm just, I'm like, I want to go home. And I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> So we untied him and let him go home. Oh, he's, still my, he's still my client today. but Is he? Yeah. Did he go a bit more extreme or? He's more, he really likes being told to run on the spot and get his bum paddled. <laughs> what, like the running man? Yeah, <laughs> he just runs. <laughs> so he does, runs on the spot and I hit his backside. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a bad experience then in this? Uh, I've had a couple of bad experiences in... It's more been to do with people confusing the relationship and thinking that there's more to it than there actually is. Um, and that's always a danger. Like, And you get that across the board, right? You get that with therapists, you get that with psychologists and stuff. You have to keep that barrier between you because if once that barrier gets broken, the relationship doesn't work anymore because it's no longer DS. Like, it's just they're thinking it's something else and that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had a couple of issues with that. Um, one person stalked me for quite a while, um, sending handwritten letters and, and you know, I had to get the police involved and stuff. Um, and another person, I remember talking to him about, like, I said I was going to see my boyfriend after the session and he was like, don't talk to me about that stuff because it makes me really jealous. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, why would it make you jealous when this is what we're doing for our time and that's separate to what we're doing? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And, and he kind of smoothed it over, but I always had that in the back of my mind. Um, and then we done a session. He started, We used to do the same thing every time. But then we did this session where he wanted to change the role play slightly, which was which was fine. I thought, okay, well, change is as good as a rest. Um and we changed the role play and it went really well the first time that we did it. But the second time that we did it, he kind of overstepped and he ended up trying to manhandle me. Really? Like grabbed me and I went, right. So I thought, right, well, I can't even kick him in the balls because that won't put him down because I've been doing ball busting with him for years. Um, and that was quite, that was quite scary. But, you know, I sat him down and made a, a chat and I said, look, I will never see you again. Like, that's that's it. That's not, you've crossed a so line you, now. you cancelled him there and then? Yeah, absolutely yeah. there and then. And he wasn't happy about it. And he was like, oh, much to owe you. And I was like, don't even worry about the money. Like, just get out of my house. Um, and he got up and he was like, he just threw money down at me. And I was like, why do you need to be such a wee wank about it? Just get out. Like... Um, and he left and I've never seen him again. So so with the police matter, did they know what you did? Yeah, uh-huh. Did you find they supported you during that stalking experience? 
The only reason that they couldn't fully support me is because he didn't live in this country. But otherwise, they yeah. took it super seriously. So Please. I've had a really good um, experience with police. And I know a lot of people haven't, but in my experience, I've always been very upfront about what I did. And, and um, I remember living in this flat a while ago and I was doing dorm and from it, it was rented. Um, and the landlord found out through a newspaper article what I did, which was a bit daft of me anyway, being <laughs> on the, in the newspapers. But um, he started hanging about the back garden, like outside my bedroom window and stuff. And uh, then he put my rent up and I'm like, that's kind of, that's extortion. Like you're yeah. putting my rent up. You can't really do that. And he's like, it's for maintenance. And I was like, hmm. So I knew there was another article coming out. So I just started saving up like mad so that I could buy a place. But um, but he, so I was sitting in the living room one day and the door goes and there's two cops there. So I opened the door and um, and they were like, can we come in? We're just here to do a welfare check on you. And I was like, do you mean a welfare check? So I'm thinking, I mean, my laundry's been piled up for a while. As one of the neighbours noticed that I've not been doing my washing. <laughs> yeah. And they're thinking, like, I'm depressed or something. That's what I thought it was, right? And um, they came in and, and they sat down and they were like, so what is it that you're, what is it you do? And I went, well, a couple of things. Like, I'm at university, I'm doing geology. And um, I said, that's why I stay in Paisley. And they were like, okay, and what else do you do? I went, I'm a dominatrix. And they were like, oh, Right, okay. <laughs> and I says, right, so what's the welfare check for? I mean, is it because of my laundry? Because it was a big pipe <laughs> on the couch. They were like, no, it's because you're a dominatrix. I was like, oh, I'm fine. Like, I do this. I could be a geologist if I wanted to be, but I'm doing this because I love doing it. And they were like, so you're not being, like, made to do it? I went, no, I'm I'm fully independent, self-employed. I pay my tax as well. Like, I'm going for a mortgage, so... And she was like, oh, right, okay, well, that's right. So, like, you're not being coerced, aren't you? I went, no. And you don't have anybody here against their will. And I was like, no, I says, you can have a look round if you want. And I said, actually, what would be really good and helpful if you could do it is, can you have a look round all the stuff that I've got? And if there's anything that you believe I shouldn't have, then I'll just put it in the bin, get rid of it straight away, because I don't want to cross any lines. And they were like, oh, okay, cool. So <laughs> I walk in, took them round all the stuff and they're looking round and they're like, God, this is cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they checked all the cupboards and what everything. What did it look like in there? Like a proper dungeon? It was like a big kind of studio. It was like one big room. There was like a scaffolding structure for like doing suspension. There was uh, a big throne um, to strap people into a cage. Um, all of those things. And, and just the other wee implements hanging up. But um, but yeah, so they had a look around and they were like, oh, this is cool. And then they went, can we put our body cams on now? I was like, yeah, that's fine. So they put the body cams on. They're like, right, so we're just having a check. And they went all professional, just having a check round. Um, and then they left me alone. Wow. And then I later found out it was my landlord that had called them. Yeah. Could he so, kick yeah. you out for that or hand you a notice or is it? Um, No, because what I was doing wasn't illegal. No. Nah. No. No, so I know it isn't. if I was selling sex... And I had another person there, then he could kick me out because that's illegal. But because um, I wasn't selling sex and well, I didn't have any flatmates or anything there, it was fine. So there's nothing that he could do. <laughs> 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 yeah. And the place that I'm in just now, like I helped police with, um, they came round inquiring about someone that used to be on the kink scene who'd been attacked in Edinburgh. She was out running. Somebody grabbed her and I don't know, I don't really know the ins and outs. She just disappeared for the scene altogether. Oh, um, no. But they came round asking, like, did I, had I spoke to her? Had I spoke to her friends? Had I heard from her? And I was like, no, I've not heard anything. And they were like, what is it you do? This is Dominatrix. And they were like, oh, okay, cool. And um, I was like, do you want to see the dungeon? And they were like, yeah. So I took them downstairs to see the dungeon. They were like, this is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, it's quite cool. Um, and they were like, I would do this. I see if I was near a cop, I'd do this. Yeah, <laughs> like, I know you would. Um, but yeah, that was fun. And like, I dated a cop for a while as well. You didn't? Yeah. How did he take cop. it? He was so into the scene. I met him on FetLife. Yeah. Um, and he was he was more and he was into like more extreme stuff than I was at the time. So what like um, he was he wanted me to be in a nappy like and do like <laughs> adult baby play, and I was like, I'm not getting a nappy. Oh. You can get a nappy. I'm not getting a nappy. 
So it was it was pretty strange. But yeah, we kind of disagreed over that. So I was like, I don't think this I'm is... Not that I'm not into the same stuff as you're into, mm. so it's probably not going to work. Do you but find yeah. that you've met many sort of partners through this, uh, from that, should I say? Um, not really when I was a dom. Like, I just... I found dating... Pardon me, sorry, kind of up and down. That. Like, when it came to, to being a dom... Mainly because I always had in the back of my mind is someone just wanting to say they've shagged the dominatrix. Mm. Are they in it because they want free sessions? Are they with me because it's really me? So I always had that in the back of my mind and that kind of... And it was more about me and my view of myself, I suppose, like rather than anybody else. So nobody really... While I was doming, no one really had a chance with me because I was always... A, it's going to end anyway. I had a foot out the door. Um... I did. I used to date a lot of vanilla guys, like guys that weren't really in the scene. So you go for the complete opposite. Complete opposite, I know. And then I'd get them into stuff. (laughs) 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 Um, But yeah, so the like the last guy that I dated, I dated for a few years, and he just wasn't interested in any of it at all. And that wasn't really for me. Like, did he know you did it? Oh, totally fine with it. Yeah. He so just we wasn't into it. At just all. wasn't into it. It wasn't into trying anything. Wasn't and he didn't try to sneak a butt plug up his ass while he was asleep. Oh god, or no! I mean, he can use his ass. Like, <laughs> I've, I've smelt the shit that he's done. It's not. Yeah. Oh. So, so yeah, like he just wasn't at all into anything, and and that was. I don't mind somebody that's like a novice or not, but he was, wasn't even like kind of open-minded about it. No. So I took a break for about a year and then I met someone on that break and I had no real kind of big intention of going back to Domin. So I was just enjoying doing the coaching. I'd started the business in lockdown and, um, and I thought, right, okay, well, I'll we'll just see how this goes. So I met someone out with of like any of the Dom stuff. So it was just, me and I was just being me like there was no more Megara or any of that stuff um there was no worry about is he just want to shag a dominatrix is he just what so all of that stuff wasn't in the space for me um and we got together and like it's just it's such a different relationship that I'm in now than yeah. I've ever been in before. Well, so. met him, he's lovely. Oh, he's great. You can hear us out there, I so we've got to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get a shag the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so... So during the early years then, uh, what was your social life like? Um, As a dom? You were working as a dom. Yeah. But, but what did you do in your social life? Oh, so my social life was like... I just love partying, like, mm. every weekend. I've been out every weekend since I was 12, like. <laughs> I started, I had my first drink when I was 12, so. Wow. Um, and I was every weekend since then, so every weekend was just, like, going out and partying, and because I was earning so much money as a dom, and I had so much free time, I was just like, this is great, life O'Reilly, so... You know, I'd go out for drinks, and I would just tell a sub to pay for them, like, you're paying for my drinks tonight. Or again, links in the description box. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was great, and and that was kind of my social life was like other doms, other strippers, other. It was people all in the industry because right. we got each other. It was like we could talk to each other about stuff, and we could talk to each other about stuff without having someone go, oh, "What's the weirdest thing you've ever done?" Because we know the weirdest things that we've done each. So it was like all of that stuff was away. Um. I did kind of hang about with a lot of people who weren't in the scene sometimes and what I found was I'd get invited to events or dinner parties or whatever and I was the shiny penny and it was like, tell them all stories about your work. They just go in and in. They want to tell everybody they know a dominatrix. Like, oh, look at my cool friend. And, And I just, there's times where I just want to switch off, you know, and I didn't want to talk about it. Um, And that kind of annoyed me a little bit, but... Because how did you differ between Regala and Andrea? Exactly. So it was hard to like, when that stuff's getting brought back up, when I'm just trying to be in and be Andrea, and then they're like, tell them stuff about work. And I'm like, well, nobody's saying like, tell us stuff about your HR job, Linda. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about your spreadsheets, Rob. (laughs) (laughs) So going back to your first husbands, we we kind of skipped Mm. through that one. Um, Yeah. Yeah. 
So I was working as a dancer and I ended up over in America. My friend, had a, she'd married a, a Navy officer over there. He was a doctor and he was working at Camp Lejeune, which is the biggest marine base over there. So I went over to see her after she got married. He'd been on deployment and um, and I ended up working in a strip club over there. So we ended up back at a party one night with all these marines and... Um, and I met this guy, Josh, and we got together. And then I was travelling back and forth to see my pal and also to see him. And and um, then we ended up just deciding drunkenly to get married. Think, and in the back of my mind, this is how daft I was, but I was always searching for something. I was always like, this will be the thing that will fix me. This will be the thing that will make me happy. This next drink, this night out, will be the oh, that will be the one, right? Or this pill will be the one, or that line will be the one, or that mm. car will be, or that ha- everything. I was always looking for something outside. Because I was just like this, like half a person, you know, that kind of hole in the soul type thing. So um, in my, my mad wisdom when I was drunk, I was like, married people have got it together. That's what <laughs> I'll do, right? Their life sorted. I'll get married. That's what I'll do. So I said yes immediately. Um, so we got married and... And I woke up the next day and I felt the exact same. And I'm like... Where did you get married? Was it in a church or...? Oh, we we drunk drove down to the courthouse. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, and I had had, uh, high-heeled knee high boots on again. So that was my (laughs) theme (laughs) right through life. So so yeah, we got married and, um, and... he took his hat off and his hair all popped out. And I was like, oh my God, get that hat back on. (laughs) Um, You didn't give him a little snip snip. No, <laughs> before, before my domain days, before my domain days. Mm. So yeah, so we, we get married and then the next day I woke up and I just felt the exact same. And I'm oh. like, oh, this hasn't fixed me. And now I'm married. Shit. How am I going to get out of this one? Yeah. He's like, let's go to Bed Bath & Beyond. And I was like, I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> so I was having this pure out of body experience. Like, what, what have I done? Like, and I'm going to hurt this person and I don't know what to do about it. And I was like in pure panic mode. So then he was like, he was, he just turned super jealous, like overnight, super possessive overnight. And obviously it must have still been there, but he just hid in it for so long because of the distance and all that. Um, And also he was like a massive alcoholic and, and so was I. So I was like, because I just loved the sesh. I loved getting out. I loved, and I couldn't have won. If I'd won, like, it's game over. I'm out for three days. So he was like the same as me. The only thing that stopped him drinking 24-7 was like the the fact that he was in the, the military. So mm-hmm. he had to be at work. But um, so we we were just like, just two absolute messes trying to create something that works. And um. So we would go out on nights out and if a guy even looked at me, he'd be like, what are you doing looking at that guy? It's what you're wearing, look at, like, you're my wife and all this stuff. And I was like, I can't handle oh. this. So um, so I got a flight home and I was like, I can't do this anymore. What, well, you had to file for a divorce from that? Yeah, so filed for a divorce. Um, he agreed to start the separation earlier than what we'd separated so we could get divorced quicker. Um, and then when it came to serve him the papers, he moved across America and they were like, it has to be the same person that serves him. So you're going to have to pay his travel costs all the way over and back. And I was like, I can't do that. So we had to like get it emailed and stuff like that. It was really difficult. But yeah, we ended up getting divorced. And then um, at that time I was at university. So... When I was young, when I was painfully shy, the one thing that I was really good at was academics. So I just stuck my head in the book so I didn't need to speak to anybody. I couldn't put my hand up and ask for help, so I made sure I never needed help by just getting right into it. And um, so when I went to university, I was the same. Like All of that stuff came back. I was a straight-A student. I was like top of my class. I was the class president. I was getting medals. It was like... And a lot of myself, it was the only thing that my mum was proud of as well. So my self-esteem was tied right into that. And um, I got to third year. So we'd split up the end of first year. 
And um, so I'd done second year straight A's again. I'd get into a better university. I'd switched and all that. And it was great. And I'm like, I'm going to get a first and I'm going to end up in Australia and I'm going to be earning all this money. And it was brilliant. I had all these like plans and dreams. Um, I'm not going to be a stripper anymore. I'll ditch the dorm in like this is it. And, um, and then I got to the second round of exams in third year and... I was sit. I was lying in my bed. It was like eight o'clock in the morning. I'd woke up. I had a weird dream about Josh. That was my ex-husband. I had a weird dream about him, and I woke up the next day, and I was like, "That was strange." So I looked at my phone, and I went on Facebook, and I scrolled down, and all I seen was R.I.P. Josh off on his pals, and I was like, "Surely not that Josh. Like it can't be." And I'm going. I got a message from him two weeks before saying, "Hey, how you doing? I really love you, and I miss you." And I, I was like, I'm not dealing with that drama. So I deleted it and I blocked him. And so then this was like two weeks later, I had that dream, woke up, saw RIP Josh. And I was like, what is this? So then I messaged this girl, Marianne. I was like, Marianne, what's going on? Like, why am I reading RIP Josh? What is this? Mm. Um, and she was like, eh, Josh is dead. She's like, he's killed himself. And, and I was like, you're fucking kidding. And honestly... It was like the worst pain I've ever felt. Like, because he tried to message me as well the two weeks before, I was just like, I can't. And I felt guilt. It's normal to feel that, you know. A lot of people don't feel bad, but you're going to, right? So, mm. and I was like, I don't know how to handle this. So I got up and I was just like, you know, that way I was crying that much. It was silent, like, and I jumped in the shower and I was trying to get ready because I had a session at 10 o'clock, like a kink session. And this was at eight and I'm like, I've got two hours to pull myself together. It didn't cross my mind to cancel the session. And I think part of it was just, well, you I, want, I want normality here. Yeah. I want things to be normal. Shock. I don't want to, I don't yeah. I want a kid on this isn't happening. Let's have a normal day. Um, so the guy came in and I was like, I could barely breathe. So I put a blindfold on him. I was like, so he doesn't see me crying. And I uh, done the session and I just didn't speak the whole time got him out and then and I just like I just didn't know how to deal with the trauma I didn't even know it was trauma because at that point like I mean I'd went a period in my life where I didn't cry for 11 years like I'm just not a crier I'm not a I'm not a great processor of those kind of emotions right because when I was younger nobody was coming to help me so so then um I went into uni and I tried to just keep going with that but the stuff that I'd learned in first year was out in my head I'm like I can't my mind's going blank. I don't know how to do anything. I went on a, a field trip and I was doing like a very basic mapping exercises. And my maps had been sent to like the teaching council as examples of good work. And um, so I'd done this mapping thing and I showed the guy and I was sitting there just, you know, that way you feel like your head's in like a bubble mm. and you can't hear people properly and all that. So I slid the map over and he's like, what is this? You've not even joined the lines up. That strong, that strong, that strong. Like you're going to need to do that whole thing again. And I was just like, and I'm sitting there with like four other people in this, that we were all sharing the house with. I'd forgotten my towel, so I had a tea towel to dry myself oh, okay. <laughs> Um But I just thought, I've ruined this. I've ruined this whole thing. Like, that's my uni career done. So I went in and told my the head of my year, and I was like, listen, I'm, like, my ex has killed himself and I don't know what to do with myself. Like, do you mind if I ask how he killed himself? Um, he shot himself in the head. Oh, shot himself in the head? Yep. So, so then I was just like, I don't know what to do. And um, I left, I dropped out of uni and I said, I'll go back next year. But I just couldn't. Like, I could not face it. Couldn't. I couldn't, didn't know how to fail. Didn't know how to recover from it. I didn't realise I was dealing with trauma. I couldn't process. I didn't none of the tools that I needed. Um, my mum was no help at all. Like she was just like, well, "You're going to need to get a job," and I'm like, "Well, I don't. I don't think I, I can even. I can't. I'm not even washing myself here." And you know, I was doming, which was thank God I was doing that because I was still getting clients coming in. Um, but I remember for about two years after that, I was so depressed that. Like at Christmas time, I didn't even go up to my mum's for Christmas. I was so embarrassed that I didn't have enough money to buy presents. I had enough money for cat food and I didn't even have money to put in my gas meter. And I was just sitting there in the house. With my, I told my mum I had to look after the cats, which was nonsense. I just didn't have any presents. So I was just sitting in the, the house, like freezing cold, 
just like, what is my life? Like, mm. I can't sit like this. So that's when my drinking really took off and then I became alcoholic. Like, it just, that really took over and I was just like, anything, so I don't need to feel anything. Mm. And um, that went on for a good few years and up to the point of, 2018 when I got sober and I thought I need to start dealing with this and and that's what I did I went to three different therapists before that and every single one of them was like I don't really know what to do with you and I'm like am I that fucked <laughs> <laughs> like, that you don't know what to do with me and they're like you're just headstrong like you're so headstrong you know what you want so what is it you need help with and I'm like I can't get my mind to do what I want it to do anymore like I want to study I want to be good at this but I can't, my mind's blank. So then the doctor put me in antidepressants and then I was forgetting words mid-sentence. I couldn't find my, I was looking for my keys four or five times a day. Like it just, it put, numbed me like to a point I couldn't function. So I come off them. Plus whenever I took antidepressants, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this or if it's just my warped mind, but um, the first one that I took felt like I was coming up in an ecky. So... <laughs> My brain's going, it's party time, right? <laughs> So then I'm like, I want a bevy all the time. And it made me want to drink all the time. So I didn't realise how it was going to feel when I took the first one. So I took it in the morning. And I'm going to meet my pals for lunch. So it was Mistress Scarlett and this client of ours. So we're sitting in Chayovna, which is like a pure fancy <coughs> Thai restaurant, right? And they're chatting and I'm chatting. And then I just felt this like rush. Then I'm sitting there like pure chewing my face, <laughs> trying to eat my dinner, and I couldn't focus. And you table. feel you could keep your legs still. I no. found when I tried it, my legs were constantly. I was all like, like <laughs> I was all over the place. No, I've not told them that I've like started this medication or anything, and they're like chatting away to me, and I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 no <Can I have laughs> some water. <laughs> it was so funny. So then. Um, we just, I just stayed on them for about six months and I thought, I can't do this anymore. Um, and they they were actually making me feel worse. So I'd went to the doctors and I was like, this isn't really doing anything for me. I'm just drinking more. Mm. Um, they're like, we'll put you in a higher dose. So the higher dose came on. And then um, I was walking around Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Fringe, which is like the big comedy festival. It's on for about a month. Um, and I'd, I'd went there every year. And uh, I remember going into a comedy show, laughing my head off and then crying all the way to the next one. Because I was just like, I don't want to live like this anymore. Like, I'm in limbo here. I don't want to die, but I don't want to live like this. Like, this is unbearable. So I was walking along this wee street and I, and I thought, what's going to hurt less? A front of that bus or over that bridge? Like, that's what I was trying to work out. And, <sighs> and that thought was like, that was a wake what have I just thought there? Like, I've literally just planned this. And I'm like, I need to get home. I can't, this is too much. So I went home and um, I had a friend of mine who'd got sober and he was talking about how amazing his life was going. Like, I saw his career just fly. And I'm like, I'm going to phone and see how he's doing that. Because maybe, maybe I should stop drinking for a wee month. A wee month will do me, I'll sort me out. So I spoke to him and he was like, you're going to come to a a 12-step meeting. So I went along to that. That's where my whole journey of like getting into coaching started was there. Really? So I learned that there's no, there's nothing outside of me that's to blame for how I feel. There's nothing outside of me that's going to make me feel better either. It all has to come from inside. It starts with your thoughts and your feelings and in your actions and in your outcomes. Um, I learned all about that. I learned humility. I learned to put my blame thrower away. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop blaming everybody for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and my life just changed. Like I've been sober ever since. It was the twenty eighth of August two thousand and eighteen. Wow, congrats! Yeah. So it's been three years, but yeah, it's cool. Well so talk about your coaching. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so two thousand and nineteen, I did NLP, and I trained under a guy called Ali Campbell, and um, and I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought well, here's a wee tool I can use in sessions. The reason that I decided, I done a, I done a one day taster session with him and he said, he was talking about phobias. I said, see if you can take a phobia away. Does it make sense that you could instill a phobia? And he said, yeah, of course. You could make a man afraid of his own dick. And I was like, oh, fucking <laughs> sign me up. How much is it? How much is it? A grand, did you say? Fine, I'll do it. So um, 
so that's why I decided to do it that was literally the only <laughs> reason um so I did that and then the next year uh, I decided that I was going to try my hand at being a PT because I was really into bodybuilding and fitness and stuff and I bought a course for that which I've still not completed <laughs> um but then uh, the pandemic hit lockdown and and I thought right now's a great time I've got a wee bit of money put away I'm financially fine what am I going to do where do I want to go with my life because this is this is another one of these crossroads right um and a few years before I'd had a conversation this is when I was in my drinking days with a guy called Ian who was my best 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 pal and uh and we were very drunk we were drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels together and uh he used to get drunk. He used to drink a bottle of whiskey and pitch a tent in my living room. I'd go on dates and come back and he's in my living room <laughs> with a pink sheet between two chairs, <laughs> steaming on a bottle of whiskey. And I'm like, this is my pal. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go and shag now. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, pretty mad. But, uh, so I was sitting talking to Ian and Ian was like, here, see if you died the Mora. Like, how do you think you'd be remembered? And he was meaning it as this kind of daft, he'd been smoking weed, so it's one of these daft questions. But that hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, how would I be remembered? I'd just be like a da- like an angry drunk dominatrix. That's it. That's all I'd be remembered for. That's it. So that rattled about for a long time. Clearly I'd done nothing with it for a while, right? I mm. thought, oh, I'll deal with that later. But then um, I got to this stage in my life where... Like, I'd stopped drinking, and then that question came back on me, like, what do I want to be remembered for? And that's when I started the trade union campaign. And Because I thought, I want to put some good into the world. That's what I want to be remembered, not just as a dom, but somebody that done something good that made a difference for people. And that's why I started the trade union branch, and then done the trade union campaign. But then I'm at this crossroads, and I'm going, right, I can, you know, I can do the doming and do it online, which I'm not enjoying because mm. I'm sitting there and I'm talking to like old man Bob with a 20 <laughs> second lag. I can't see him and he's one finger typing back to me. Mm. And I'm like, this is sold hats off to anyone that can do it full time. But that was destroying my soul. <laughs> so I, I thought, no, I can't do it. And um, and then I, I saw an advert that was Ali Campbell again. who was doing hypnotherapy. So I thought, right, OK. I'll do that then. So I did the hypnotherapy. I thought I'll be a hypnotherapist. That's what I'll do. Hypnotherapy, NLP, brilliant. I'll make millions. And um, I did that course online and I was really good at it. Like an Elman induction, should it should only take maybe five or six minutes and I can get people down in four. And I started doing rapid inductions and stuff, which is where like the fancy ones you see the street people do. So they just shout sleep and you're out. I can <laughs> do them, right? So, so that was great. And then... Um, as soon as you start like interacting with things like that on Facebook, the algorithm kicks in, they start sending you adverts, right? So I get this advert for a full coaching. If you buy this, you get the full coaching course for $7. David Key, his name was. And um, I thought, ah, let's complete the set, right? Because the set is NLP, hypnotherapy, coaching. So I took the $7 coaching course and I loved his stuff. And I thought, this is exactly what I need to be doing because the NLP, the hypnotherapy's add-ons, the coaching's where it's at, because that deals with the root cause of everything. Um, Love these metaphors. Um, He's got one that I call Don't Sniff the Jobby, and (laughs) it is hilariously funny, but I'll tell you it later. Um, So so I did the coaching thing, and then I thought, right, cool, this will be easy. I've run a business for, what, 10 years? This will be cool. And then I realised it's very different to try and get clients in that way, because... I was used to post a pretty picture on Twitter and the phone Mm. goes, right? It's a whole different animal when it comes to coaching. There's, I'm no longer top of my game. Now I'm just another coach and I struggled with that. So I hired a business coach with with some money that I had put away and um, they showed me how to build the business properly, how to market myself, how to build my my offering and my package. Um, And very quickly I had 20 clients. Wow. Wow. And um and yeah, I'd made like twenty something grand very quickly. And like I was saying earlier about being indignant about things and like you tell me I can't do something, I'll do it. I was talking to this other coach and I said, Look, I've set myself this big target of making fifteen grand in the space of three months and he went, that's a bit of a pipe dream and I was like, Oh, 
touch me. No. And, uh, and I'd done it in two weeks. <laughs> and I phoned him every time I got a new client. I was like, oh, I've just signed another one. <laughs> Hi, yeah, how you doing? How's the dog? I mm. just, I signed another one. <laughs> and he's like, oh my God. So in eventually he was like, you're, you're a woman of your word. Like when you say something's going to happen, it happens. And when you say it's not going to happen, it doesn't happen. So it was good. But, um, but yeah, I just started in... What I used to start with was a lot of metaphor stuff, a lot of hypno and a lot of um, just my own experiences to teach people like things can be that bad where you're sitting with cat food and the money in the gas mm. meter, but it doesn't stay that way. You might think life is a bit shit right now, but this too shall pass. Yeah. And here's the stuff that I use on myself to keep myself good. And this will work. If it works for me, it'll work for you. So I used a lot of the stuff that I'd learned in sobriety and the 12 steps as well with people. So it was a nice kind of amalgamation. So for your uh, life experience, it's worked out. Absolutely. There's so much gold in it. And, mm. you know, one of the things that I put a post about this the other day, but I, I call myself a gold digger <laughs> because I can find the gold in any situation. Mm. Like, um, And I love, I love playing with language because we create our whole entire world in language. And taking words like that and subverting it and turning it on its head, like, is I love doing things like that. I teach my clients to be unreasonable. And most of the time, when you say to people, I said to a bunch of Canadian women once, just how do you stop people pleasing? I went, well, you're going to need to be completely unreasonable. And they were like, oh, what do you mean? I can't, I can't do that. And I'm like, you can, because what unreasonable means is no reasons, no excuses, you just get it done. Mm. And, um, and once I explained it, they were like, oh, right, okay. Because in their mind, unreasonable means rude, stroppy, all of these things, because they have attached that meaning onto it. So giving people power over their own language is is changes our whole world, because how we speak the world ends up how we see the world. And, yeah. and that's, you know, whether we speak it in our minds or we speak it out loud, that's what we create for ourselves, so... So talking yeah. about your coaching, I've got a few questions yes. that has been sent. So I think I've talked about them earlier from our Kaz, Kaz our dominatrix Shout guests. out to Kaz, thank you. <laughs> Shout out to Kaz. Kaz, we should do doubles. <laughs> yeah. We'll put a links to her stuff in the description box. <laughs> so, so, Miguel, my, my questions. So, when you were transition, when you sorry transitioned into coaching, mm -hmm. what or who were your biggest inspirations and why? So, David Key was the want... the big inspiration when it came to storytelling and metaphor, and I just I've met him online, and I was like, I was like a kid again. I was just like, oh my god, and he told the don't sniff the jobby story live, <laughs> and I was like. I feel like I've just touched Jesus. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> so don't, don't sniff the jobby. That is don't sniff the shit. Uh-huh. I've sniff never the heard jobby. jobby. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so listening to him, amazing. Rich Litvin, I love the way that he coaches. He's just got a really nice way about him. Um, Michael Neal as well. He uses a lot of metaphor. Um, but my, like, my big female influence is definitely Mel Robbins. Like, I just love her stuff. She's got a thing called the High Five Habit just now. Um, and I follow all her things. And Gary John Bishop as well, he's great. He's from Scotland, but he's got a weird American accent. Um, and just, like, Mel Robbins' thing is, like, the High Five Habit. So you got up and you high five yourself in the mirror. What, so, every morning? Every morning, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> I've what I'm doing, tomorrow, doing yeah. it. <laughs> and she's like, high five yourself and say something nice to oh. yourself. And um, so all around my house, every mirror's got a poster on it that says high five me. I make everyone do it. I'm like, you high five yourself so you in the mirror. So you actually touch the mirror? And... Yeah, high five myself. Oh, I'm right. like, yeah, so you're doing, you're doing <laughs> a good it. job. So the next question is, what do you think all young girls should be taught when growing up? Um... There's a lot I think they should be taught. I think they should be taught that you don't need you don't need equal pay or equal this or equal that to know that you're equal. You're equal by very right of being human. Mm -hmm. And you create your whole world in language. So if you even acknowledge that you know that there's an imbalance or anything, you create that for yourself. You start living inside of that belief. And that's something that I've never believed. I've never once believed that I am... It doesn't matter how much you get paid or I get paid. I've never believed that we are unequal, like, mm. because we're human and that's what makes us equal. 
like we still feel pain we feel these um, we feel emotions we feel happiness sadness we go to the toilet and we shit like <laughs> we, eat, we have a job exactly we have a job <laughs> but um but yeah I think just having that growing up with that sense of like you can do anything you want you but want to be a mechanic go be a mechanic mm. if you want to like the one of the things that started my feminism was being really wee and I and I saw um fighter pilot adverts for the RAF and I was like that's what I want to do and I was like mum I want to be a fighter pilot and she was like you can't be a fighter pilot and I was like why not she went well because women can't do that you're not allowed to in the RAF because I was only wee and I just it made no sense in my mind why but why because we're women how I can fly a plane. I'll be able to do it. And she was like, you just can't. And that, like, that made no sense to me. So mm. I think just letting pe- women know, young girls especially, that you can do anything you want. Mm. Anything. Totally agree. Mm-hmm. So that leads to the next one, <laughs> question. Do you think women are still taken less seriously in business? If so, how can this be combated? Um, I think that there's a lot of, stuff and everyone does it this isn't just women right there's loads of people that every single human being in the planet but we live in like a world that's created by the stories that we live in Mm. so that's the thing that we need to combat because you are whoever and whatever you say you are right and like like I realized very young when I moved from that place to that place you, you can be whoever you decide to be and that can change in any given moment. All you need to do is decide. And if you want to be taken seriously, you need to take yourself seriously. Definitely. And you need to see yourself as a serious person because your relationship with yourself defines the relationship that you have with everybody and everything else. Agreed. So, and yeah. you know, once you develop that real strong relationship with your own identity and you enroll yourself in the possibility that you can do anything with your life, then you will naturally enroll others. Like it's just a given that you'll give off that energy. And um, but yeah, so I think if you're not being taken seriously, you need to look at are you taking yourself seriously. Do you fully believe in yourself, or is there doubt in there that you need to start working on? Well, that's what I find. Though there is often the odd spout of doubt in anything you do. How do you mm-hmm. turn that around into a hundred percent confidence? So I have a, a process that I use that I've developed so that people can self coach. So they don't need a coach. So that they've got the tools where it doesn't matter what room or what situation or what conversation they're going into. Sometimes the confidence comes from knowing that you've got the tools, not that you're going to need to use them. And um, so I've got this process, and one part of the process is you need to, you need to really you need to call the spade a spade and call it out, <laughs> right? And go right, okay, what is it I'm doubting here? And therefore, so the, the whole process is, the first part's WTF, right? What, what the, the fuck, fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so the W is what? What's the problem? What's the challenge? What's missing? What is it that's annoying you? What is it that's there? The T is time. How long has it been happening? How often does it happen? How long have you been dealing with this? And the F, how's it making you feel? So, and you get it into a sentence, as succinct and laser focused as that. And then you go into a five-step process and you can, once you've been doing this a while, you can do it in your head in about four minutes before anybody's even noticed that you're triggered. So the first part is dig. So we want to know what is it you're believing about yourself that's creating all of this? What is it that you're believing about the external thing or things? And what is it you're believing about the future? So if it's my husband's pissing me off because every time I do the dishes, he moans about the amount of soap I use, right? It could be something as trivial as that and I'm annoyed. And um, okay, well, what is it you're believing about him? What is it you're believing about doing the dishes? What is it you're believing about the future of your relationship? What is it you're believing about yourself? Because there's beliefs that are running under that that's creating that upset. And then from there, well, where else do those beliefs show up? Where else do you believe that you're not as capable as you should be? Where else do you believe that people are criticizing you? Where else do you believe that you're not good enough? Mm. And then start to zoom out and see that everywhere, right? Okay, well, I've been doing that in quite a few places because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, right? So you start looking at that, okay, cool. And then you look at well, what's that costing you if you keep believing that? And, and at the same time, you're going to do the second step, which is declare. So you need to say it out loud or you need to write it down. Get it from here where it's causing all the mayhem and it's got power over you to somewhere outside of yourself. 
where you can see it laid out because then you're separate from it and you can go, right, that's absurd, that's ridiculous, why am I believing that? That's not true. Mm. Um, then you go to distinguish and in the step distinguish is we look at, um, we, we create a, we distinguish the truth from the stories. So we ask the beliefs four questions. Is it true? Is it not true? Um, am I just wondering or am I just making it all up? <laughs> and then we create a future distinct to the one that you're heading towards right now. So that would be, well, what do you really want? What's the, what's the great, what's the best outcome? What would make you the happiest? Well, he leaves me alone to do the dishes and we just, we have a nice time or he takes me out more or we get a dishwasher or whatever it is. Okay, cool. Then what would you need to be believing to make all of that possible? about him, about the dishes, about the future, about yourself. And then um, once you've got all of that, then you go to the next step, which is decide. So now instead of choosing between what you've already got and the unknown, so you're always going to choose the what you've already got because the unknown's scary, right? So now we've got two hands out in front of you. You're choosing between what you've already got and a possible new future. And you're always going to choose a new one, right? Because it's, it's the one that's making you the happiest. And once you've chosen that, because you're making a powerful choice now, not just deciding that that's going to be better, then um, you go to discover and you just decide what is the next tiny action that I can take that will take me from this path to that path. Mm -hmm. And then you, you go for it. So it might be that you, okay, I'm just going to buy a dishwasher. Yeah. Or I'm going to go and, and just have a chat and say, look, See, when you say that to me, it actually makes me feel like a bit shit. I would really, or you stop doing the dishes and tell him to do them if he's that bothered. Have a dirty protest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do the dishes and but get you know mad at him. I used to do uh, with an ex boyfriend, he always used to get me to do his fucking washing. <laughs> so I once put all his white shirts in. Of course, I put the fucking red, red top in, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Never asked me to do it again. Amazing. Says him right. <laughs> you've been great Tom <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so I've got that's how I pull myself out of things as I use that process it takes me about four minutes in my head done wow. brilliant yeah. I can take that on board yeah <laughs> definitely have you ever had to stop working with someone because they were too self-destructive um no I am um, I've worked with a lot of people and I'll spot that in the first call mm. like there's some people who mm don't take the coaching there's some people who are so determined that, to be right about something that they'd rather be right than be happy or they you know they're so ingrained in their stories and they want to hold on to them cool do it mm. because there's nothing else i can do i can give you every single tool that i've got it's up to you to use them there's nothing i can do if they don't use it. i can't and i say to them at the start you know there's there's the sessions, but the value of coaching comes between the sessions when you go mm. out and put this stuff into practice. And if you don't put this stuff into practice, I'm not coming through your door to say, have you done that thing yet? If you turn up and you've not done your homework, it's no, I, I'm still going to sleep at night. You're not. You can't physically hold everyone everyone's hands, you know. Exactly. And, you know, I've had p people who just don't, they don't want to change. And that's all right. But there's nothing wrong with that. They're just no ready for it, and that's fine. They've not had enough. We, when I was in recovery, I used to call it get out and gathering evidence. They don't have enough evidence yet that this isn't working for them. And it's like, okay, well, maybe you need another failed relationship, or maybe you need to lose another job, or maybe you need to pick up again. I don't know what that is for them. But all I can do is give them everything I've got, and then if they use it, amazing. But I know through, through experience of working with people that if they use the tools, they will get ridiculous results. Like one guy walked into his boss who they're in the middle of redundancy in the whole company, people getting let off, let away right, left and center. And he's like, oh, I can't can ask for a pay rise. I mean, yes, you fucking can. Mm. And he went in and he got a 20% pay rise, a better company car. He got promoted to director. And then he's going in and he's having, he's going to be going and having a chat with these bosses about opening a whiskey distillery for them. He's like, I'm just going to, he's like, I'm going to pitch for 14, he's going to pitch for 14 million. Wow. This is a guy what? that can't ask for, for five grand on his salary. Good grief. Right. But now he's got this unshakable self-belief 
that there's nothing he can't have just things he hasn't got yet and I'm like what a powerhouse another guy started two companies another woman who's a um, she was a, a person who'd created an app which is like got all of your vaccine information in it all your passport details direct links to your insurance company if you're abroad and you can't get a hold of a phone um, all of your covid stuff like like real time updates if anything changes in the country in terms of covid um, it's also got a section on it that tells LGBT people are you in a safe space like are you in a safe place safe country all of that stuff too scared to tell anybody about it and I'm like this is this is world changing and she's like I know but I'd like I don't want to tell people about it it's just I don't know and I'm like oh my days and now she's like are we working with some big uh, travel insurance companies so that they'll take it on board, offer it to their customers and they'll pay her because then she'll advertise them on the app because she wants to use that. She's, she had this thing about taking money, didn't want to feel like she was charging for it because it felt unethical or whatever for her. Mm. But her big dream was to open a retreat for refugee women to go and like have a safe space. They could spend like a week or two as a bit of respite get together, cook together, just like, and just be in a community. And um, and I said, but that's where your money's going. It's not like you're taking money, but you're, it flows through you into this next project. And you need to tell people about that. Like, I want you to take this app on because this is my big dream. And then maybe they'll invest in that too. Like, you don't know. So she's already telling everybody about that now. But, well done. But yeah, so it's like the results are there, but they need to take it. So I learned from Kaz what pancaking is. <laughs> Earlier on, you mentioned castration device. <coughs> yeah. So did you, I don't know if you've watched Clarkson's Farm, you know, the farming no. thing with Jeremy Clarkson. Absolutely hilarious show. It was so good. But there was a bit where he was castrating the lambs. And um, it's like this device. It's got four little prongs that stick up and you get these wee tiny, wee thick rubber bands. You put it over the four prongs crank this thing open it, it stretches the band open and then you just drop their balls in and uh, and let it I've never used it right so but you take the band off and it just like sits around the balls I mean eventually the blood will die the blood circulation will come off and it'll it'll just drop off well, your dick will drop off balls um, balls yeah balls or, or dick I suppose I but do people actually Go through I've, this procedure. I have never used it in anyone, but I do bring it out. Like if someone's like, I just want domination, I'm yeah, like, bring I've it got out this. Up, yeah. I've got this castration <laughs> thing. So what we do is we get this band right and then I crank this open and then so if I just let that go right on you and they're like, Whoa, oh, oh. Yeah. you can see them turn white as I'm explaining it and I'm like, <laughs> Cool, so let's have a normal conversation about what you're into now. <laughs> Has anyone ever had to go to the hospital because of this? Um, because of that contraption? No, because of um, just you know Dom- getting involved in this in the in these <laughs> activities. <laughs> one one guy had to go to hospital. Um, I ask everybody at the start if you get any health issues that I need to know about. Do they have to sign a disclaimer? Uh, no, but they do send me all in writing on email. All right. So I said, right, if any health issues, no, nothing. Okay, cool. So he came in for ball busting. Wanted kicking the balls really hard. I mean, okay. So kicked him in the balls and he was like, oh, I feel a bit sick. And I was like, okay, cool. You all right to continue? And he said, yep, yeah, definitely. <sighs> so I had him up in the St. Andrew's Cross with his arms up, kicked him in the balls again and he fainted. So he's just like hanging there with his head down. And I thought, right, okay. Um, so I'm going to get him down off of this. So you always take the feet out first. Because if you don't, then if you take the arms out first and they fall forward, they'll snap their oh. legs, right? Top tip for anyone using a St. Andrew's cross. <laughs> um, so took the feet out and um, took his arms out and just supported them. Got him down onto the ground. And as I got him down, um, it kind of ended up on his knees. But what I wanted to do was get him on his bum and put his head between his knees. But I got him on his knees and he was up and he's like, oh, I mean, you just fainted, are you all right? You're a bit disorientated. And he's like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I was like, but I'd really like you to sit with your head between your knees. like. And he's like, no, I'm fine. I, honestly, I'm totally fine. I'll probably just call it a day, but I'm done and and I'm okay. I said, right, but I'd, ra- I'd feel better if you at least just had a wee lie down. I'm not sending you away like this. And he's like, okay. So 
we've we've chatted right and then I turned around to get a cushion to put him in a and as I grabbed the cushion I heard thud mm. and I it was a split second and I turned round and he'd fell forward and cracked his he had a massive big nose right cracked his nose off the the floor and the floor's quite hard it was that carandine flooring um cracked his nose made a groan so he's fainted again I didn't expect that um, made a groan and he's burst his nose oh. and there's blood pouring out his nose and I'm like oh my god this is not that's not normal that amount of blood right so I'm like is he is there an artery that he's nicked or so oh. what's going on here so I slapped his face woke him up and he's like oh fuck fuck oh my nose and I was like listen don't worry you've just your nose mm. is broke it's burst <laughs> You fainted again. I'm so sorry. I, did, I I got the pillow. I didn't catch you. That's my fault. And he's like, don't worry about it. I was just feeling lightheaded. I was like, you're bleeding a lot, pal. Like, we're going to need to take the hospital. And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. It happens all the time. I'm a haemophiliac. And I was like, uh, that was something that I needed to know. Why wouldn't you tell me that? And he's like, oh, it didn't even occur to me. I've had it that. I've been like that long. And I went, right, okay. Got the blood mopped up. Um, he's like listen I'll, I'll take myself to the hospital he's like because like I just I don't really I don't feel comfortable with you coming with me and I was <laughs> like fair enough I. so I put him in a taxi and he went he went to the hospital and he's like but honestly this is the coolest story I can never tell anyone <laughs> 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 he's Where delighted with it <laughs> but yeah so we packed it all up and, um, and he went to the hospital but that's the only time mm. that's the only time I've had a few fainters but he was the only one that was like Break injured or anything <laughs> yeah I imagine that people when they start out doing this, they keep it like private from the family. Mm. Did there come a point, a crossover point for you where you like decided to let your family know? I have let my family know since the start. Oh, have you? Yes. So I was a stripper before I was a dom Mm. and and I said to my mum that I was a stripper and she was like, okay, well, as long as, you know, if you're ever unhappy, just stop. And she's always empowered me to do do whatever I want. So so then... um, I started the doming and we were sitting out the back just getting a bit of sunshine. I'm sitting there, my mum's there, my sister's there. And um, I was like, oh, mum, guess what? Guess what I'm doing next? And she's like, what? <laughs> like, I'm going to be a dominatrix. And she's like, what's that? And I explained it and she's like, okay, well, as long as you're, if you're ever unhappy, just stop. And I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, that was quite, she just didn't even flinch, not at all. But we had an argument um, a few years into it and we used to clash all the time, still do and um, and she said to me she kind of almost threw it back in my face of like well I've never told your gran or your dad what you do and um, I went oh okay that's your power move here, I'll be taking the power right back out of that, fine picked my phone up, text my dad, dad by the way I'm a dominatrix <laughs> send <laughs> what's next and she was like well <laughs> and I was like don't don't push me in that way like I've got no qualms about it the only reason that I didn't tell my dad is because I'd kind of lost touch with my dad my dad was he was in the Bell Grove which is a alcoholics um homeless hostel for 11 years so we'd kind of lost touch he went a, week, a lot off the rails um but then so I sent that message didn't get it back and I thought oh well and uh it wasn't until I bought my house, my new house. I have well, new house, been there for six years. And uh, and I needed somebody to come and help me to just build some of the dungeon and, and stuff downstairs. And my dad's an amazing tradesman, like, and when he's sober. So he worked in the rigs for years. He's an engineer. Like, he's just great. So I spoke to, I phoned him up and I spoke to him and I was like, Dad, would you mind coming and doing some, like, um, some pipe work, some plumbing and things like that? I'll help you with it. Like... Um, but I've just bought a house and he was like, yeah, okay, cool, no bother. Um, he says, where, where is it you are? And I says, I'm up in Springburn. Uh, it's down in my, it's going to actually be like my basement room. And he's like, oh, it's not it's no a fucking dungeon you've got, is it? <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, aye, I got your text. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. Did he, did so, he give, uh, sorry, did he do a good job? He's done a great job. I <laughs> no. He wasn't very like, I mean, he's he's old, he's got gout, he's got arthritis and all of that stuff going on. So it was mainly him 
telling me what to do and going right do this and do that and then that goes there so I was kind of helping he done a, he done wee bits of welding and stuff just things that was enough for him to be able to do um but yeah he was a great help mm. and he found it hilariously funny <laughs> he's just like he's gonna be in queue sending me pictures of things like chains <laughs> and all that <laughs> laughing his head off <laughs> But um, but my dad just lives in a comedy, you know. Mm. You know, we all live in a movie in our life, right? So some people might live in a drama and everything's dramatic. Some people live in a weepy and it's like everything's sad and it's always like anxiety and sadness. And um, my dad lives in a comedy. Like mm. somebody could fall and break their entire face in front of him, and he would piss himself <laughs> laughing. <laughs> so everything's funny to him. But yeah, and he's been great. So now, like he got sober a year before me. And he's drank since he was 12. And um, his mum died. And when she died, the alcoholism died with her. Mm. Just stopped drinking. Wow. So there's something been there. I've never, he doesn't want to speak about it. He's done with it. It's, it's gone. But um, but yeah, that died with her. And so, I, so, you know, a year passes and I'm like, it was always my dad I used to point at, right? When I get as bad as him, I'll stop drinking. But then I had nobody to point at and I'm like, oh, I'm the alky in the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then that's, that was another thing that kind of triggered me getting sober. But now um, after he helped me and stuff, I moved him upstairs from me and he now lives in the flat above me. So you look after him? Yeah. And we're best pals. Like he comes down for brunch every Sunday. Oh. We have a great time. He never really, he never got another girlfriend after my mum. But recently he started getting interested in women again. So what is he on Tinder? We were, we were saying <laughs> we were going to get him on it. I says, oh, that gate will be going like there's a storm. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're on Tinder. And uh, so we were, oh, he's just so funny. But um, he told me that he asked out the doctor's receptionist. And I was like, oh my God, you're adorable. How did that go down? She said, no, she says, thanks. Like, I'm really flattered, but I've got a boyfriend. And he was oh. like, oh, that's that's fine. He's like, I've never asked him out for years. So thanks for no embarrassing me. And he says, I was dead red under my mask and that. And so <laughs> it was just adorable. But so I says, well, let's let's see about like getting your girlfriend or something. So we'll see what happens. But I'd love for him to meet somebody. Just for that, like, he's got me, right, as his daughter. And he's got like his pals and stuff like that but he's not got that side of his life you know he doesn't have that companionship of somebody that he's in love with so yeah so what does he think about the activities going on down below he finds it hilarious <laughs> absolutely <laughs> hilarious because he lives in a comedy so mm. um so he's got stories that would make people's hair stand on end like because when you're you're living in a hostel and it's full of alcoholics it's all sorts of things going on I mean, he, one of the reasons that I wanted him to live above me is because I dropped him off one day and the next day I was going down to pick him up. He's like, oh, somebody gets stabbed in front of me over a tin of corned beef. And I was just like, right, okay. He says, now they're looking for witnesses and I don't want to say anything because I'll get stabbed next. And I was like, you're not going back there. Like, leave your stuff, just move. So I put him on my couch for eight weeks till we, the flat, I could get hold of the landlord of the flat upstairs and I just put him up there. And um, and he, you know, he drank, he relapses. I was cleaning blood sick and shit out of his room, and it was all up the walls. And he tore his esophagus and his mm. diaphragm. We retching and we're up and down at hospital and all that, and it was hard going. But the day his mum died, that was it. Good. No more. Has your sister had a tour of the dungeon? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, very briefly. She's been to my house once in six years. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> we're, um, we're not I don't know if we're speaking or not right now oh, <laughs> I don't dear. know what's going on there so I love her I think she's great but there's just I just never hear from her so busy lives yeah very busy lives <laughs> 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 yeah it's a bit mad alright then so thank you very much <laughs> this welcome. has been quite educational oh, it's been brilliant <laughs> can I get a tour of your dungeon yes <laughs> <laughs> we should do part two in the dungeon yes yeah. yeah. Please let us know what you thought about this video in the comments below. Andrea's links will be in the description box. She's got an email down there. And she also has the website for coaching. Yes. Yes. Definitely take a look at that. She's accepting yeah. new slaves. And Jen is accepting 
People find out to wear saves. organic cotton gimp suits. Is that, is that your new line? <laughs> gimp suits and financial slaves. <laughs> <laughs> All links in the description box. Thank you for being with us for this podcast. We will see you next time. And thanks most of all to Andrea oh, for coming all the way down <laughs> Thank from you. Glasgow.